Lee Hart, welcome to Between Two Beers. Well, thanks for having me. It's a real honour. I'm a big fan of the show. Big fan of the show. So thank you very much. Great to hear. Uh, there's no way for you to know this, but you have entered the studio with two super fans, huge Lee Hart fans. So uh, I'm not sure if you've got anything planned for the night or for tomorrow morning, but we've got a lot of areas to get through. So I hope you've got nothing on the table. Sounds fun. It's good by me. I don't have a lot planned at the moment, full stop, to be honest. So yeah, we could go for months. We'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we might have missed an opportunity. Uh, I don't have a Waka Changi. Are you, are you working with a Waka Changi there? Yeah, I'm running with the, um, where are we? Yeah, Waka Changi. And the can now, of course, uh, which yes. is... Uh, yeah, it took a while getting there, but there you go. Crack that now while we're here. The only thing, yeah, the only thing that might make that better is a uh, Between Two Beers uh, branded glass there, which uh, oh, are now yeah. available. Oh, fantastic. Available for purchase. Where, where do we get those? Uh, we'll put yeah. one in the mail. Okay, fantastic. Oh, that'll be great. Because I actually prefer that in a, in, in a glass, funny enough. So, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> What, is, uh, what, what does Wednesday look like? What did you get up to today, Lee? Well, good question, actually. Um, and as you know, I mean, it's, we're sick of talking about it, but we're in lockdown here in Auckland. But I'm managing to get into um, this office we've got to try and do work and, and do stuff and pretend we're normal. Um, sat in this house at the moment, which has been um, kind of stressful in many ways. Um, can we speak um, – it's a word for in English – um, going through separation, so to speak. Oh. You know, so we're, yeah, okay, right. So um, yeah, yeah. it's pretty heavy for this stage of the of the podcast tonight. Yeah, <laughs> but let's yeah. be honest, right? Um, but anyway, so that's been quite full on all that. But still trying to get work done. Um, no TV on the horizon. I was supposed to be making a TV show around about now, um, but because of COVID and stuff, you kind of parked it. And this time of year, it's too late to start something. I think like that so just working on as you say the the, the beer and um chips and that kind of stuff that just kind of ticks away when we're when we're doing nothing but it, funny enough it still keeps you busy you know yeah uh we like i said we've got a lot of areas to cover the way we do things at between two beers we tell the audience how we know the guests are shape how do you yep. really have yeah, again, there's, there's, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Massive fan. You burst onto the scene while I was still at Hamilton Boys High School as the oh, yeah. uh, international snail racer, then that oh, yes. guy. Yeah. I, I vividly recall Thursday mornings in tutor class that Stephen was in as well. He was a couple of years younger than me, but me and uh, Michael Edwards would, would go over the episode, would talk about the defensive bomb, and kind of that continued. That continued through my adult life. Um, I have to thank you. I was in Papua New Guinea for two years working. Um, nights where I was wanting to be home or wanting to be anywhere else, I would pop on late night big breakfast clips and uh, giggle away to myself to to um, to take myself out of that situation. So a, a, const, a constant for about uh, 21, 22 years. So um, excited, very excited. And, and you feel old. Uh, yeah. And you've got to get out more. That sounds, you know. <laughs> And um, and I, I guess Stevie, you you probably followed a similar path, although albeit a couple of years younger than me. Yeah, my very very similar. Um, Lee's been an ever present in my adult life. I think I was a teenager when he first made his appearance on Sports Cafe, and yeah, Moon TV, Olympico, oh, that guy's world, uh, Mysterious Planet, the whole bouge. I've been along for the whole ride, so really excited. I, I sort of did a, a certain amount of skiting once we locked you in, telling a few sort of close friends that Lee Hart was coming on the show. One of our biggest fans, Patreon, Scotty Gallagher, said, Lee Hart, snack a changi, best chip in New Zealand. And I said, <laughs> fucking right, Scotty Gallagher. You are so right. <laughs> Me and my wife have been on a bit of a, a crisp eating journey, I guess, over the last... Oh, my season. God. Now I've got to get that. But tell you what, it's been a blur when you, when you put it like that and you, you guys going on about being teenagers and stuff. It does kind of make me feel old, but it does kind of make you think how, how that all started. And... Excuse uh, the expression, but a comedy of errors in a way, just how it kept going. I think there was a lot of rhyme and reason to it, but um, yeah, it's it's only when you hear it back like that, they actually go, you know, that's actually quite cool. A lot of those shows that you mentioned, you know, and, and let's get back to some of that at some point, I think, you know. So I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to cover a lot of that ground. I just want to start with a little snack of Changi chat. Yeah. Because 
like I say, I've been searching for a good chip, and I think I'd read that Madeline Chapman of the spin-off did this big sort of chip expose. Yeah. I think it was like yeah. 130 chips ranked from 130 to one. Uh, like number one was Bluebird Original Salt and Vinegar, two was Burger Ring, three was Grain Waves, whatever. But then she felt the need to write to republish an article with about 800 words saying, no, fuck all that, I yeah. have found New Zealand's best chip. And this is what she wrote. She said, how to describe this chip? It's perfect. That's it. I want to submit an official Information Act request to find out how, among all the bougie chip brands and stalwart chip brands, did Lee Hart, Lee Hart from the Sausage Ads, yeah. the perfect chip. I don't know how you did it, Lee Hart, but your clever marketing skills have produced a genuinely astounding product. That deserves yeah, it's really, really one, it's one of those, those weird, when it was, those weird sort of backhanded compliments where they're actually going on about how good it was, but how did he manage to come up with it kind of thing. So <laughs> I was reading that going. Because she didn't really like the marketing by the sounds of it. She just loved the chips, which is, which is great, which is the best marketing anyway course but she was going oh, i don't really get the marketing and this sort of stuff which well, was oh, okay that's fine but no they are good but i do remember you got to take a little bit of credit for the for the taste of the chips as well i remember the very first meeting with griffins you know who, who make the chips you know they do eater and all the other sort of chips and they, they make a lot of great chips and i was in this first meeting and they're going well what are these chips going to be that you're going to make um because i approached them about sort of you know under the wacky changi sort of brand and I think initially they thought I was going to make like beer flavored chips or something, you know. And I was going, well, that's that sounds absolutely heinous, you know. Why would you why would you, why would you do that? And they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, what are your top four selling or three selling flavors now? They said, you know, salt and vinegar, salted and barbecue. And I said, well, it'd make more sense to just do that, wouldn't it? And then you know we'll just get a small share of that market. And they went, oh yeah, that's a good idea. So we did that. And then they said, well, what sort of chip do you want to do? And I was kind of unprepared for the meeting a little bit. So I went, I was sort of thinking on my feet. So I went, well, what chips do you do now? And they, they said, well, we do a, a thick one, a, th a thin one, a thick one, and a kettle fried one, and a crinkle cut one. And I said, well, can you do all of that to the same chip? You know, can you take a thick one, crinkle cut it, and then kettle fry it? And they went, looked around the room, and they went, can we do that? Some guy went, no, I suppose. And and that's what they did. And somehow I think it locks that flavour in. I don't know. So look, they, they've come up with the flavours and stuff, which are great. But I think that helped a little bit, you know, somehow locking it in. But yeah. it's going to show you don't know what you're doing half the time, but sometimes yeah. it works. Um, there's, we're going to talk a lot about your, your business side of things uh, later on. Um, and there's, like I said, there's so many places that we could have started the set, but I actually wanted to start reading something that uh, Brent Spillane has said yes. about you, who's your cameraman who's worked so closely with you yeah, yeah. TAB uh, Sports Cafe days. Mm -hmm. It says that Lee actually takes his comedy seriously. He takes TV very seriously and puts a lot of thought into it. He'll stay awake at night trying to come up with ideas and he will stress a lot over it, but that's because he cares about it. He wants the end product to be something he's proud of. That's the side of Lee that people don't see. And I, I sort of wanted to pick up a bit from, from Brent, and we want to sort of showcase a side of you that people don't know so well. And one of the things that jumped out as perhaps the most interesting place to start is from the age of 7 to 11, you grew up in the Andes, at the top of the Andes, 13,000 yeah. feet up, four hours drive from the nearest civilised town. It sounds yeah. like something that you would make up, you know, on one of your sort of you know, nonsensical rants. And I remember hearing something about it a while back and I was like, is that a gag? Is that, is that real? Like that's an insane thing to, it's an insane place to live for those years. So it's how, totally true. And you're right about it being an insane gag because I've made the mistake in the past of doing like, before my voice kind of got too shot of doing public speaking, you know, emceeing or, you know, when you got to go speak about yourself or something. And I made a mistake one night and said, you know what, instead of just speaking absolute crap, I'm going to talk about my, my own life as if people actually would care, you know, for once, you know, and where I grew up. And I started talking about Peru, where I did grow up. And they're all just, there was no laughs, there's nothing. And at the end of it, they actually bombed real big time, the whole thing. And, you know, I self-indulging thought that these people would care. And it was exactly that. People with, afterwards are going, I could hear them talking going, you know, I thought he was funny. You know, if he, if he was going to make stuff up, he might as well be funnier than that. 
you know, as if I'd made it up. But I was just trying to be honest for a change. But yeah, no, what happened was my, my I actually didn't, I left Peru, um, New Zealand when I was about one or two, moved to Hong Kong first. Um, my father was a sort of engineer building tunnels and hydro schemes and all this sort of stuff, and mainly tunneling, at coal miner. So we moved to Hong Kong for a job there and then Melbourne for the underground. I think I started school in Melbourne when I was about five. And then we moved to Peru, the top of the Andes, for this huge sort of irrigation project, which is literally, honestly, in the middle of nowhere, just llamas, Incas, all this sort of stuff around the place, Inca ruins. Um, yep, as you say, four hours from the nearest, the, what you'd call civilization, living in a little little house with about another 100 families at most, little school with about eight kids. And as I say, 13,000 feet, it's high Mount Cook. So there's the altitude thing going on. If, if you're pregnant, you have to go down down the bottom, have the baby three months. You know, you couldn't be up there after six months pregnant. It's pretty full on. Um, yeah, so people don't really believe that, but it's, it's amazing how that was such a formative part of my life. I've got stronger memories of that than I do of, of the 90s, um, well, for a lot of reasons. But, um, <laughs> no, but mainly that were just really, you know, really formative. Um, and I've been back since, of course. I um, did some filming up there. You mentioned Mysterious Planet earlier on the TV show. Um, I made a point of going there and literally to where we lived, and it's still there, the little camp we lived, just abandoned, like something out of one of those, you know, those documentaries about where they used to do the nuclear bomb test and all the houses are still there. That's what it's like. We're walking around a house. It was quite eerie. But that place hasn't changed and, and a lot more tourists got there now, thanks to the roads that my father's job built. There was no tourists when we were there at all. Um, so it was really, really fascinating. I've always had a connection with Peru. And funny enough, it seems to come up in later material. Somehow there's this weird fixation with Peru or South America or Spanish and stuff, which I used to think I knew, but I found out when I went back, I didn't really know anything. But yeah, no, it's certainly it's certainly a huge, huge part. And I took the family back there a couple of years ago. I took my kids back up there who are bored shitless. But you know, it was it was great. It was great. Lee, it's such a it's such an interesting thing. Like I, my my mum's from the Solomon Islands, so I remember going to the Solomons as a kid. You know, that sort of same age. And when you do things like that that other people don't really get to do, it feels yeah. quite normal. But when you look back at it now, yeah. as a you know forty something year old man. It is an incredible upbringing and something that which must have set the tone, I guess, for your um, your, your future years. I think so because I think that what, if anything, I, I suppose I had thought about this: how did it affect the decisions, decisions I might have made later on? And all I can think of is that I had no pre pretense; I had no sort of expectations from New Zealand. I didn't even know who the All Blacks were until I was about ten or eleven when I came back to to New Zealand and everyone's playing cricket and rugby and I better pick this up pretty quick. Whereas before that, you know, we were just with our parents, listening to BBC radio, um, and we had a sense where we were from and all that sort of stuff. But we used to come back and visit grandparents, but it didn't have this um, New Zealand, strong New Zealand connection, um, which ironically now somehow I think some people associate me with this sort of Kiwiana kind of thing, but it must have come later because I'd like to think um, ideas and stuff that I was thinking of were, have always been a lot more international in their sense anyway. You know, what would make what us laugh? It didn't have to be a Kiwi gag and that, that sort of question of what makes Kiwi comedy and where do you feel? I, I don't know. I've never thought about it that way. If it happens, if you do it in New Zealand, I suppose it's Kiwi comedy. You know, it didn't have to be about Kiwis per se, you know what I mean? Um, but it certainly made me think maybe take more risks or something or I wasn't um, I don't know, I wasn't content just to, I'd already had a sort of a weird background. So I think the best way to, I don't think I ever felt like I fit it in as soon as I came back anyway. I had a weird accent, especially when I first I went to boarding school. It was all always pretty weird. You always felt like a bit of an outsider. All your mates were going off in the holidays to their parents. The first couple of years, I didn't see my parents for a whole, like, for a whole year at a time. And you'd go and stay with the sort of people. So I always felt like an outsider. Um, and I suppose whatever I ended up doing after that, I, that enabled me, I think, to just to give it a crack. I'd, I'd already overcome the, 
feeling like an outsider. So I didn't really have a problem with trying to start a band or trying to do TV, or whatever, which maybe would have been more daunting had you been brought up with the expectations of the norm, you know what I mean? Um, it's not to say I didn't have um, anxiety about stuff or, or made probably rash decisions, but, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't think it, I think it helped, put it that way, somehow. And I don't want to move us along too quickly. I don't want to do a disservice, but I'll, I'll try and, and you've already done a very good job of summarising some of that post Peru, but allow me indulge me for a second while i regale your own story to you so you, you come back you come back to christchurch yeah. christ college a, a school report I've, I've read you quoted as or maybe it was your dad saying thinks he's funny but wouldn't fill the town hall just yet you carry yeah. on to university your dad then says i think you're fucking around here lee why don't you come over help me work on the channel tunnel you work on the channel tunnel yeah then the music bug hits you um, really get into music. You mm -hmm. end up in France, a famous concert, maybe in your own mind, with Jimmy Barnes, which <laughs> yeah, then well. gets you arrested, deported, back to New Zealand, which, again, this all sounds farcical and, and like something that you've made up, but it's all. I encourage our listeners and watchers to, to do your research. You'll find this is all very, very true. Yeah. And let's pick up the trail now at film and television school where not only yeah. were you studying but you were also putting hours and hours into a publication called the moon yeah so yeah i think you know i was into music at, at, even at school and stuff and if anything i probably thought i was um, more of a musician than anything that was my dream but in retrospect i think i was probably better at tv than music i don't know but so we got deported from france as, as, as you said we were, we were playing over there jimmy barnes was i think the night before we got deported we went to jail for 11 days in Lyon in France. And as that's that there's only three of us in the band. And that stage you started to sort of question I think we were arguing a lot anyway, you know. <laughs> you talk about big bands breaking up for good reasons. We were in jail together. We were just sick to death of each other. <laughs> so we we got to put it back to New Zealand. We thought, okay, let's at least have, take a break from each other. Um and I said, what am I gonna do? You know, because all of a sudden we've skipped university, only went there for a year and a half, no qualifications. So I wanted to keep things, I suppose, um, a little bit creative or, you know, I think it's ego more than anything. The band wasn't working, so maybe I could be into TV. <laughs> it's just like you just transfer that lack of skills you had into something else. So then a friend of mine had done this film and TV course the year before, and she suggested I might try this. And I did that. And funny enough, I wouldn't say I failed at that. I, I mean, I, I, I realised... I, was, I thought I was quite good at what I was doing there and I was looking at things differently than everyone else in the class. But the practical part, because we're actually cutting film together at that point, you know, it's the same as now. The actual very practical things of, you know, um, I had to put a new toilet seat on the other day just, and you want to see the mess in there, you know. Same sort of thing. I would have my, my in, in the exam, my film tape would have audio tape spliced in within it and stuff, you know. Um, so all I learned from that was, this is the sort of stuff I want to do, you know, you know, and then of course you have to make a decision. Oh, of course you mentioned the moon newspaper. So I needed to sort of pay some bills while I was doing that. So I always liked that sort of satirical writing, like, you know, Viz magazine, all this sort of stuff, sort of back in the day. I suppose the onion now is the most the similar thing to it. Um, so I ended up writing this newspaper, all the articles, fictitious articles like, um, you know, the Garden City Yeti, this sort of stuff. It's amazing how much this stuff ended up coming out years later. Um, but I was, I was amazing when you're young, and it's actually, this is what keeps me up at night now, is how prolific you were when you were young. I'd write this stuff, 20 articles in a week, and then I'd go sell advertising, and then in those days, I had to type it up, print it out, stick it on these broadsheet things. They'd glue all over my fingers and letters and headlines stuck to my head in the morning. You know, been up all night with coffee and drinking, trying to write this paper. Send it off to the printers. We'd come back with probably about uh, 1,500 typos in it, but it didn't matter. Then I'd distribute all these papers to cafes and bars and stuff. And it was only just breaking even, but that was the way I was imagining to keep um, my head above water. And I called it the moon because it came out monthly, you know, as opposed to the sun or the, you know, so I thought that's quite a clever name. 
Um, decided to move to Auckland to get a job in TV, applying for every job like everybody else, making coffee for people. And it's funny, these weird things you do, which you think that never made any money, that was pointless. Often they're the things that did make the difference because I applied for a job at Greenstone Pictures through this other girlfriend of mine who said her father ran the place. And he said, look, I'm, I don't want to see anyone else. We've got no work here at all. She said, you've got to see this guy because he was an ex-journalist. He's written his own newspaper. I did about 13 publications of the thing. It's just ridiculous, really. And, um, <laughs> and he said, oh, God, here we go. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see him. And he was just fascinated. Who is this idiot that's bothered to do this? You know, so he ended up sitting there and he's reading it. And he's going, oh, that's kind of funny. But being an ex-journalist, he just couldn't get past all the, the typos and stuff. In it. But eventually he said, look, we've got no work. But we've got um, a think tank coming up this weekend. Why don't you come along with that? And if any of the shows get funded, I'll give you a two weeks' job as a researcher or something. Ended up one of them or both of them did get funded, neither of me. Um, so he gave me a job. I ended up having that job for two years at Greenstone Pictures as a sort of researcher, writer, sort of ideas guy for him. And we just got on like a house on fire. Um, and we're making all those sort of shows like Motorway Patrol, the zoo, all those sort of stuff. I was writing the scripts for the zoo, motorway patrol. That's where speedo cops came from, a band drama. I said, we've written all this shit already. After, this is, speedo cops is exactly the same as motorway patrol, which I wrote the proposal for the TVNZ and got funded. I remember saying with the proposal to this guy, John Harris at Greenstone, I had to drive around the police cars. I said, this is boring as bad shit. It's never going to be a TV show. No one's going to watch this crap. He said, oh, no, we'll put that proposal in. Got funded. It's the most successful show they've ever had. <laughs> so, <laughs> but at least I was familiar with the, the fact that nothing ever happened. And that's what later on with Moon TV, Speedo Cops was. It wasn't the fact we were wearing Speedos. It was taking the piss out of the genre of that. Nothing fucking happens, yet you can stretch it out for half an hour with, but then drama after the break. What? You know, <laughs> the headlights not working, you know. But anyway, it, yeah, so it all does tie in. No matter how mundane or pathetic you think what you've done is, it probably will come out in a later part of life somewhere, I reckon, you know. <laughs> so I, was, I was having a, a socially distanced coffee uh, today with a friend. We're talking about at Lee Hart, and he's like the, the, the snail, the snail racer on Sports Cafe. And I feel yeah. like among uh, men of a certain age, that was a real moment that, that yeah. we all like watched together. We lived, experienced, and then watched that character develop. Can you just run us through the background of, I think Mark Ellis came to a flat that, and sort of talked you into it. Can you tell us? Oh, that story? oh totally. And it's, it's funny that it has become like, an, actually, I should try and track down all the footage from that property because it's actually pretty rare now. It is out there somewhere. Um, yeah, so I was working in that semi-serious job at Greenstone Pictures, you know, trying to make it in TV and probably trying to be a film director and stuff in this flat. And um, Mark, who was, I didn't know him that well. He's more of a mutual. He's played touch rugby with a group of friends and that with him and had mutual friends, basically. And um, he came down to our flat, um, actually trying to ask one of my mates to come and be on the show as this fake guest because Portscaff, Invariably, there'd be a guest that pulled out or they hadn't organised a guest and, the, and someone would have to get one last minute. And normally, Mark would call in one of his mates and, um, and <laughs> they'd go on the show and, and, and do this. Mark asked my mate who was busy or maybe he thought better of it, said, no, 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 I'm not doing that. Go and ask Lee. He might, he might do it. Sure enough, he came and asked me and I was, maybe because it was Mark, I said, oh, fuck, well, what have I got to lose? I'll, I'll do it. Next thing I know, I'm driving to Sky Studios then in a car with him, and I've got a Tupperware container with um, about 10, five, five, 10 snails in it. In grass I'm, and I'm, like I'm, five I'm really curious. Was, was, the snail, was the snail idea the idea that was pitched, or did you, between each other, work out that that was I that think, you were I doing? think I'm going to have to say, I think Mark must have already had that because he had that. I didn't go get snails out of the garden or anything. He already had these snails, so he must have already thought that. So I can't take full credit for that. So, <laughs> so we're driving in the car, and I'm sort of, I haven't really, at that stage, I haven't been on screen a lot by then, you know. I was quite familiar with TV and I backed myself, but 
I was thinking, I've really got to give this, I've really got to go for it if I'm going to do this. And only Mark knew that I was the fake guest. So Lana and Rick, none of those people actually knew because they didn't recognise me. They didn't know who the hell I was. So they assumed Mark's, this is, I'm a real guy. Um, so I'm on, so, and Mark's sitting there and I'm trying not to get his eye contact because I knew I'd laugh. So I'm trying to be serious and they ask me questions and I'm going off to the American champs, snail racing champs next month. And these are my snails and stuff. And Lana's looking at me and, and I end up at one point, I think back in the footage, um, actually killing one with a shoe, like putting it down like it was lame or it was humping one. I don't I remember, know. I remember that. Something you do under the pressure of camera, something you kind of regret. But look, um, and I remember everyone else staring at me like in sort of shock. And what I remember most about that night was in those days there was no studio audience at Sky Studios. It was literally just the cameraman and stuff. So um, I can't remember if they added um, sound effects later on or not, but it was a very dead sort of sound. It might have been funny, but I, I didn't feel it was funny. You weren't getting, you know, like, a, you know, from the audience or anything. So at the end of it, I was really kind of a bit bummed out. You know, I thought, oh my God, I just made it all ask myself. And I went back and my flatmates didn't say anything. They didn't say, oh, that was so funny. That was so funny. You should go, you know. It was kind of really weird. So for about a week, I was thinking, oh, God, this is terrible. What have I done? And then the following week, they rang up and said, do you want to come back and do a follow-up story where you're at and an apology about what you did, being a fraud? I said, oh, that sounds quite funny. So I said, there was a sort of serial to And then as what happened, there was, you know, the guy, a mate of mine, the cannonball, he was the sort of roving reporter guy who left. And um, Rick said, so, you know, he heard that I was involved in TV anyway. He said, oh, shit, you want to come on to a weekly story kind of thing, you know. And from then on, that's when I started working with Brent Blaine, he mentioned. And we would just basically would go out each week and try to sort of top last week's story without repeating ourselves. And that was the hardest challenge because, you know, I'm not saying other people do nowadays, but often it's the same. We're really weary of not doing the same thing the same week in, week out, you know. Um, and that was quite hard. And that's why I'd probably struggle for ideas and I'd rather... I'd rather not have an idea and still be thinking of it in the car on the way to Waikato Stadium or the way to Christchurch on the plane than having a shit one the night before, if you know what I mean. I'm better off just to wait. It will get a, it's worth waiting, you know. And the more the pressure built, something would definitely always happen. But, oh, the snails. Yeah, that was... Um, you get- can, can, this, can I just jump back to the snails? Because there's three things for me that stand yeah. out about that clip, and I, it's not like I've That's analyzed it. it. There's not like I've, I've, I've analyzed it frame by frame. But the first thing is um, the, the ability to keep your composure together when I think Lana or someone says, "Don't you, don't rip its house off," and you kind yeah. of turn and you say, you, you, "It's deadpan delivery." Are, are you going to yeah. take this seriously? That was the first <laughs> yeah. bit that that killed me. The second bit, I think Tony Hodgkinson, who was a New Zealand athlete, was sitting beside you, and the way the camera angle was was done, you're leaning over with the snails, and she, you can see her over your shoulder, and her look is like, what oh, no. the fuck yeah. is going on here? <laughs> yeah. And and the third thing which which caught me, and I think hooked me, was the the throwaway line about drugs in the sport, and oh, yeah. that when you get when you get to the states, you'll be going for it. Yeah. And yeah. I just fucking that that was it for me after those yeah. kind of things. I was like, this is this is amazing. And it just kind of continued through that whole spoke. Sp- oh, I can't even speak. I think it's one of those moments. It was all unrehearsed. When I, when I, we didn't have any sort of lines. This is not sort of thing you do with Mark in a way. He's kind of quite – so I'm glad I came up with that line about the, you know, is there any drugs in your sport? Well, once we get over there, we'll certainly be going for it. Um, <laughs> and then they were like, what? You know, because especially – and I think, remember, I had a whole lot of um, – I had like a powder. powder on my nose as well. So I'm just sort of <laughs> washed up drug addict who's racing, <laughs> racing snails in the States. So I'm going to have to lock that clip up again. But the, the deadpan part um, was a combination of you've only got one shot at this and it's only going to be funny if you keep it totally straight because if you if you were laughing all the way through it, it's almost pretty lame, you know, oh, this is a snail racer. But if this guy believes he's a snail racer um, and where that where – he's insane or not, doesn't matter. The fact that he believes it is what's funny and he actually is going to the States and there is this, you know, nowadays there are a lot of weird people out there who take it seriously, a Bigfoot conference, a Bigfoot conference is exactly like people like that. So that's all you're doing. Um, so that was the key there. It was just, but it was quite hard. 
But I think, as I say, the nerves of the whole thing with the lights and and it was the early, early part of my TV, I suppose. I'm probably more likely to crack up now, you know, if I'm opposite someone who is funny and we're talking away and I know what he's going to say. It could be someone like Jace or someone I'm working with. And, yeah, probably more likely to crack up, you know, during a radio show than I, than I would on that because I was so kind of, in, you know, so tense about the whole thing, I suppose, yeah. That's definitely one of your strength. Well, one of your many strengths as a comedian is your ability to remo- remain stone faced under some hilarious. Some of the back and forth you've had with Jace over the years or late night. Oh, yeah. breakfast, being able to just not laugh seems like a real superpower. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> Until we do, though, of course. And that's what makes it so much better, too. Like, it doesn't happen often, but on radio, it happened a few times. Um, not so much on TV. <laughs> on radio, it happened quite a lot. And there'd be moments where I remember there's two and a half minutes, the whole voice break, we're just like pissing ourselves and people in the car are sort of thinking, oh, losers, get on with it. But what it would be something really childish we were laughing about. And when you've spent, as you say, your whole career or the whole year anyway, not trying to do that, and it suddenly happens, it is like being at high school again and once you just can't stop, you know, and it's, and it's probably not even that funny what happened, it's just the, the timing of it. But you're right, I mean, I do find in general comedy um, the tragedy, the seriousness of comedy and like is funnier. You know, someone who doesn't think he's funny or something, you know, it's not about punchlines, it's more about, you know, more, um, you know, it's that that's all like the Alan Partridge or the David Brent stuff, you know, that these are real, they're believable characters, if you know what I mean. They're just kind of losers or tragic and they don't realise he thinks he knows everything, he doesn't know anything. You know, talking about someone's bonnet and going on, you know, the solenoid, just clearly this guy knows nothing about a car, but he believes he does, you know, and so that's kind of what it is for me, you know. Just uh, linking, linking back to Sports Cafe, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why it holds such a dear place in like i say people of, of my ge- age or generation um but it seemed like you had all these sort of rogue characters or elements all just trying to sort of upset yeah. rick he was trying to hold it together i was watching back some old clips there was about like 10 people all surrounded like no one really knew who was going to say what or whose turn it was you were like playing in the band it's like is it, yeah. is it really playing those instruments like like what the yeah. fuck is going on here but it's so like you couldn't not watch it yeah so it's, it's like a car crash that you have to watch, you know, and there's good shows and bad shows. And a show that felt really good on the night sometimes wasn't that good at home and sometimes a show that felt really bad on the night was good at home. Um, We didn't have the best gauge. But you're right, Rick was kind of, you know, I don't mind saying this, he was kind of the glue in a way because, of course, he had Mark trying to undermine him live the whole time and and Lana trying to pull it back. Um, Rick... I mean, well, that's what I'm talking about, this sort of tragic character who always wanted a top sports <laughs> show. He's finally got it, and he's got all these dickheads that are just taking the piss out of him. So he comes across as this tragic guy, and, oh, and he would have gone. I, I just picture him going home to his wife after every show. How's the show, honey? Yeah, oh, you know, <laughs> that's, 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 that's how his day would have ended. I remember he would give... Brent, explain and I a brief, like a um, big week of support. We'd have a meeting, we'll probably make a phone call later on. Our Crusaders are playing um, Chiefs this weekend. Um, show is normally a Wednesday. Do a story on Tuesday on, on, on the Crusaders. That was kind of the brief or on the rugby itself. And often we go, yeah. <laughs> And we wouldn't say that to him and would just do something totally different or certainly not what he wanted. It might have been started that way and ended up totally different. And Brent, of course, he's a great cameraman. He does a lot of um, Sky Sport live stuff too. And he used to do the, the camera in the studio as well. And I was in the band and I'd chuck later. And by this stage, um, actually in the rehearsal sometimes, because we'd deliver our story so late sometimes, just before the show started, because we're still editing it. Um, we only just had an idea last minute. And the first time Rick could be watching our story, he would go, and um, that guy or Lee went down to catch up with the Crusaders, uh, began this weekend, roll the clip kind of thing. And that's, I might have done speed cooking, you know, like this. And it would come, it would, it would come off him, I remember, in this, and here we go. And, and he would look straight at Brent because he never sort of had a go at me. He would always say, Brent, you know, and Brent would look at me like, 
on. Right? You know, so it was just like this weird, and then in the end it would be a popular clip and you go, oh, yeah, that was okay. But he, he kind of hated getting undermined, but at the same time he kind of realised that's what his role was, you know, and he's, especially now, he's big enough, I suppose, or smart enough to kind of admit that he brought these misfits together and he did need to allow a certain amount of, you know, chaos and we just had to, you know, you couldn't you couldn't control Mark anyway. He wouldn't be there for rehearsals. Um, he never really understood, you know, I don't think you mind me saying this, Mark never really understood cameras. <laughs> <laughs> he would do something like live on studio, it would just come to him and just sprint off that direction and dive over a thing and, and it's hilarious the studio audience is, is pissing themselves and then wonder why it wasn't in the final show or, or, you know on the live show well all the cameras are facing this way mate you ran off there and attacked the guy over there how are they going to see that you'd have to warn someone and make sure they spin the camera you know i mean he just he's in the moment the whole time he's, he's a very much alive person that's why he was so good but whereas i'd be premeditating something going shit if i do this that camera will definitely get me and maybe that one's probably going to the best one that i finish up you know i'd be directing my head or editing in my head on their behalf in a way so hey so you're not wasting their time but all your own because nothing worse than doing something like diving off the wharf into cold water and no one filmed it because you just went that way instead of that way you know so but as i say you you wouldn't um you wouldn't try and control them you know what i mean it was what it was, it was better not to you know you, you must you must have got sort of runs on the board after a certain amount of time. You know, you, you had this huge cult following and obviously your segments were so successful. And I want to talk a little bit about your relationship with Brent because it seems like a real a real teamwork effort to get some of those clips. You know, when you're sort of getting tangled in the Venetian blinds or oh, yeah. when, Marte, when you're doing the interview with the Formula One guy and you've got the Matai coming over and interrupting you and things. Like, they, oh, they must be really yeah. well planned out. And, yeah, and strategized. Oh yeah, some of, some of them more than others. Certain ones, that both the, t the two you mentioned actually. Um, the, the good thing about working with Brent the whole time is that it got more and more. We, we went on. We, we would film together, then edit together, and he's obviously pushing the buttons. But in the very beginning, I was very, very sort of. No, we've got to cut now. We've got to cut here, and this is the, my, my face there. You know this sort of stuff. Um, but after a while, he'd predict that and he would just do it anyway and then he'd only make minor trims so I could get lazier and lazier thanks to his sort of hard work. But but occasionally you do still have to... Um, we definitely think things through, but it's not just be before we start filming, so I'd have a half assed idea and I'd go, how about we... Um, speed cooking was the best one. We were sitting in the lounge... But to be honest, I was probably hung over on a Monday and I hated filming on Mondays. So I'd be sitting there going, oh, I've got to go to store by Wednesday and Rick wants us to go to Hamilton. I can't face people. It'd be great to be able to do something just here in the, in the apartment, wouldn't it? You know? um, and, of course, we're thinking still a sports show. So I thought maybe we just do – imagine cooking was a sport. So I put a headband on, that's all, that's all, and a singlet and some track pants and just totally trash the kitchen and whatever. and and um, and then I'll talk, and Brent will be going, what? You know, and I, my job then was to convince him that's a good idea. Trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. And eventually he did start trusting me pretty much 95% of the time. And um, and, and you could fine tune things to go, yeah, but maybe it should be more like this. Okay. But I, I remember that um, because we were filming it in this little apartment that had a Mount Eden Road. And I was, remember thinking, my wife's going to be home and, in about half an hour, we really get should get this finished up um, <laughs> and cleaned up because the cleanup's going to take a lot longer. And we're full on, and, and we're just it's just really because the tiny catch was just really was quite full on the first one. And in the last moment, we had to film it kind of in order in sequence because of all the mess. And you couldn't just do this shot; we had to go in order. So it, the place is getting more and more trash as we went. The last shot, I've got the fridge pulled over on top of me, lying on the ground, the door open, milk spewing all over my face, and that's I'm like this, and my wife walks in. Uh, <laughs> just that, uh, Brent's in the corner of the camera going, and I'm going, then you wonder why we're separating. So look, at, <laughs> so this, I'm sort of going, oh shit, I know where we're just, oh, you know, 
but no, he's been such a great sort of um, wingman. As I, even today, I was just with him, and um, it's great now because I film with other people too all the time, and um, and but it's always a lot easier when I film with him because we there's a, that communication. We like you guys working together as opposed to Sunny working with someone else. It's just easier. Um, sometimes it's refreshing to work with other people too, by the way. But with him, when we're doing a lot of stuff. I know it's going to get done and it's going to, it's going to be good and it well. He films really well, he edits really well. And most of all, he trusts me. Um, he's seen the worst of me and the best of me and still trusts me, you know what I mean, and has confidence that, you know, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll get there, you know. And if he trusts me, I've given me confidence, you know, as opposed to working with someone totally different and you're trying to explain an idea and they're looking at you weird all going, oh, God, it's, it feels if – you, if you don't feel 100% confident when you're doing it, you don't give it everything, if you know what I mean. You feel like you're performing for them as opposed to what you're trying to do or, you know, you're trying to convince them that it's a good idea. Because um, a lot of the ideas were in the past you didn't think were a good idea and, and they did work. So, yeah, so I've kind of given a lot of credit for that. Part, part of your appeal was you were like an antidote for the boring traditional PC interviews. Some of them, like you know, how did you how did you manage those relationships with players when you're asking them stuff like, well, what do you what do you do when you've got to do poos during a game? You know, like do you have to build have to massage those relationships to get that goal? I think so, actually, and and this comes down to sort of personality a bit, but because I'm, you know, funny enough, I'm actually quite a uh, shy is not the word, but I'm not an extrovert. I'm not type of guy. Well, excuse me. I'm not a guy Williams, uh, you know, or a Borat type character that actually would enjoy going into an environment and making an ask myself just to get some footage um, at the expense of other people. If you know what I mean. And no offense to those guys, you know, um, but it has to be going back to one of the early questions about the blinds and the Formula One interview. For me, it has to be quite thought through because, A, I don't want to offend the people that we're dealing with because if it's an All Blacks or cricket or, you know, that's half the stories we do each week, you wouldn't be back in the press conference next week if you just kept going in there, doing everything for your own benefit. All the other journalists would be going, you know. But I'd always be there, yet no one ever noticed me doing anything too over the top. It was, I'm not saying it was all editing, but it was done in a sort of a clever enough or a, you know, the smoke and mirrors enough way that they got what they wanted and I got what I wanted and the players or the management got what they wanted and they never felt ambushed or belittled or they never felt like they were the butt of the joke. Um, occasionally I knew I was going to say a stupid line, you know, to in an interview to someone and I would often sort of go, look, look, trust me on this, the interview might get a bit weird later on. You know, I might ask a couple of weird questions, but look, it'll be fine. And we'll, we'll sort of just trust me on this. And by and large, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, was sweet. That They did. Quite quite to the point, actually, where I, I think often we'd finish one of these interviews on the sideline or in a press conference and almost the players felt a little bit disappointed. Oh, that wasn't really that funny or until they saw the finished product because they didn't realise... The, the other elements we hadn't put in there yet, you know, it could be my trip on the way there or little stuff, I'm little cutaways I might have put in. I'm not saying it's all editing, but I'd, I'd much rather that the audience got the vibe and something funny than the people I'm interviewing feeling, oh, shit, I'm the butt of a joke. Because, as I say, they'd stop talking to you. And it's actually quite the opposite. Because if you ask a few disarming sort of questions like, um, you know, less stock standard questions and then you ask a normal question they actually open up and give you a proper answer instead of the, the, stock, the stock standard answers they used to give into the other journalists um so you did end up making a relationship with them i think people like james mcconey has done that now with with the players they want to talk to them if you know what i mean um they they feel it's a little bit more personal i think in general i think the players sports people are a lot more media savvy now and they they grew up with these shows um, you know, that I think I was involved with and the crowd goes wild. And they you can give them the microphone now and they can interview each other almost as, as well as we do. It, you don't need, it, it's great. And I think it took a while to break that down because 
the same when we started, it was very formal. So if you're on a sideline and you go up to Ruben Thorne and go, um, what do you do? Uh, <laughs> there's been five questions that are serious and you go, but Ruben, serious question. Uh, what, what do you need to do in a full 80-minute game if, if you need to lose? You know, kind of thing. And <laughs> he's like that and he, he cracks up. There was, a, there was a moment where I did crack up. I couldn't help it. <laughs> When I blamed the girl beside me, I went, oh, she wanted to know that, wasn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but again, yeah, yeah. It's amazing how the edited version always seems a lot worse than at the time. But you always needed to do enough to, to I, yeah, yeah, I remember standing in Speedos on the side and a crusade. So I was doing enough to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I don't know because I've, I've I've watched that back. The rig wasn't too bad in the background of, of that Crusaders clip with the speedos on. You look you look yeah. good back there. Oh wow, well, yeah. 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 <laughs> but the one um, that, the I, one with the blinds and Aussie that was that was a full on one, um, full on international press conference. Um, good example is a cough sable. Get there. I always like to get to the press conference before everyone else did, so you just look around the room and go, oh, this is, what can we do here? You know, you might get an idea. And no one else was there yet. And I remember just walking around the place and um, just opened up a cupboard for some reason, you know, and oh, it might be a fire extinguisher in here, it might be something. And there happened to be a whole lot of um, Venetian blinds in there. <laughs> and for some reason, which I thought was weird, and I looked at the wall and there was Venetian blinds on the wall as well, which are the same ones. And wow, okay, there might be something here. Hold on, if we pull those blinds up, uh, you know, we can have them down or up. Point is, I can take those ones out and make them collapse on top of me as if they're the blind. You know, there's that sort of this thing going on. But to do that, we need to establish the whole shot. And I'm at the press conference, so, and I've got to ask a stupid question of Eddie Jones, which I think was. Um, is it fair to compare the 1921 Wallabies with the 1997 All Blacks? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like, like it's just me. And he's going, well, you know, it's just like, you know. And then I held the blinds, the fake blinds, you know, the, the ones that were kind of stacked up and dropped them on top of myself as if the real ones had fallen off and, rest, yeah. and then I'm getting out of them and, you know. But yeah, that was, as I say, I, I was pretty self-conscious of making a dick of myself. I mean, although that was my job, I, I wasn't comfortable doing it in real time all the time, you know. Um, I prefer to, yeah. You want them to be uncomfortable, that's for sure. Um, I, 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 real quick, but I've been in the position where I've been a sports team's media officer, so coordinating... And facilitating those media opportunities. So I do. Did you run anything by the media guys before you did, yeah. just to give them a, a heads up? I think as you went on, it got it got better as well. Like you end up having a good, quite a good relationship with the media liaisons and stuff. And in, I wouldn't say you got preferential treatment, but they sort of almost wanted the players wanted to talk to. They wanted to have some fun. I mean, these are just young guys. And they don't want to always be talking mm -hmm. to the same old journalists. So they want to talk to someone who's having a bit of fun. So. Within reason, the media liaisons were quite good. They go, oh, yeah, okay, look, 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 if you wait at the end, we'll do this and this and so-and-so will talk to you, this kind of thing. So, yeah, we probably got, I would say, preferential treatment over a lot of the journalists, like, you know, just a Radio New Zealand journalist was trying to get, like, a thing. Um, there was almost a market for, um, that was slowly building for the sort of faux journalism kind of stuff, you know, to keep the, the youth, to keep the young people interested in, in the game, I suppose. Um yeah, and you still see that today. Um, all those guys are, have grown up with it, they're familiar with it. Um, and it would be, uh, be quite easy now to go and interview the All Blacks, I think, you know, because they, 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 a lot of them, should, a lot of them are probably too young even to remember sports cast. But maybe hopefully some of the later shows, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> during those, um, during those uh, sports cafe years, what was your profile like? Like, you're a super recognisable guy. Like, were you getting sort of accosted every time you'd go out? And and was it a full-time – when did it become a full-time job? Or, like, when did you realise this is something you would potentially be able to do for the rest of your life? Yeah. Um, so there's never a sort of a, a – there's never a moment where you think anything sort of really changed, but it probably changed all the time. So you were getting more and more recognised, I suppose. And I think – 
another thing you've got to be, I suppose, aware of, and, and especially in my case, is that, you know, with having no hair and stuff, you're automatically more recognisable by default, you know, um, as opposed to another half dozen guys or with, you know, brown hair, you know. So that kind of helped. But I do remember a moment where the sports cafe was getting busier and busier because I was still doing the other job at Greenstone at the same time. I think after about a year and a half, two years, I flagged the Greenstone job and found I could at least do sports cap full time. And then I started thinking, shit, if I'm doing that, I need to, because I think we had a season of 30 shows or 35, it might have been 40 shows in the beginning, a year on sports cap. But I need to keep busy. So I thought in the off season, I approached Sky and said, well, well, if I could come up with the money, um, could I make a comedy show, not so much sports-based, that was the first Moon TV, and stick it kind of in the off-season of SportsCAF. I went, mean, okay, well, if you can come up with the money. I think I came up with $7,000, I think, and made six episodes uh, <laughs> of really sort of pretty weird TV. But and, and even after that, you still didn't really feel... One thing I will say... Is back then, um, and uh, and you guys remember this because you, you said this in the beginning. Everybody watched TV then, if you know what I mean. They, they didn't have the options of all the internet sort of options. So, maybe there's still quite a few channels, but Sports Cafe on Sky would have better ratings than TV One now on TV One, if, if you know what I mean on this night. So, it was, it's relative. So, I was lucky enough, I suppose, to have been exposed to it all back at that stage when there were a lot of eyeballs, you know, you guys included of that age um, and older. And now that you're still doing stuff and a lot of it's online and stuff, people familiar, I actually feel sorry for people that are, I suppose, trying to make a full-on career now purely online TV, you know what I mean? Because it'll be, mm -hmm. I think that would be hard. Don't get me wrong, they were huge, you know, um, online sort of stars and stuff. But, you know, um, as far as that, I suppose, recognisability thing you're talking about, I think the timing was was quite good for that. It would, it would be harder for me now, I'd say. You yeah. just, you know, there's so much out there, I think. It, it makes me really happy that we've spent about 40 minutes talking about Sports Cafe because I think I can <laughs> speak on behalf of Shay that we, we, we fucking love that, that era. Um, I am going to attempt to move <laughs> us along. So, like I said, I, I messaged um, Brent. And I sort of said, you know, are there any great yarns you can you can suggest for us to get leadership? here? So he only gave us one, and I've got no idea where it's going to go, but hopefully it brings us into a bit of mysterious planet chat. So he sent us this photo, which I'm going to show you. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, this is Amazon. He, he says, I've attached my favourite photo that he might be able to explain when we went missing in the Bermuda Triangle. Oh, that's that. Is that the remote triangle one or the? Yeah, yeah. That looks like the. Uh, Wait. So Why don't you snake? just describe that photo, Steve? So there's a snake. Yeah. So oh. you've got a snake. You've got a snake wrapped around your neck, and it looks like there's a parrot on someone's head, and the snake's also wrapped around Brent's neck. Okay. So that is actually uh, okay. That that's mysterious parrot. So the, uh, when I saw the snake. I was thinking that's when we were doing the Amazon special Lost Inca Gold, which was <laughs> which was also an absolute debacle. My brother came on that trip. So, yes, this is in Florida. So we did the Bermuda Triangle episode, which was the final episode, and I thought it was quite genius to sort of go, you know what, we've, only, we've got funding for six episodes. I think they were one-hour episodes from TBNZ. But how about... If the last episode is kind of like a best of the first five, you know, <laughs> so how are we going to do that and, and get away with it, you know? So I thought, well, it's Bermuda Triangle, so why don't we go missing in the first four minutes of the episode, searching for what we are trying to talk about? So we end up having this, and I think it was the end of the series too, so we're in Florida. So we're trying to make a TV show by also celebrating the fact that we've nearly made a TV show. So there's a bit of a conflict going on here. So we end up having this um, sort of massive night, I suppose. Um, and not sure, yeah, I think this, just before our last day's filming, but also we went out and we had a massive night fire in this, these sort of funny sort of Cuban Titan nightclubs with these chicks and stuff. It was just, just ridiculous. There's footage of that in the episode. And 
the whole night got sort of really messy. Um, and we wake up in our hotel the next day to go filming and we've just got no credit cards. We've got no money. We've got nothing. It's like, what the hell happened? We must have been, we've been mugged or something. And, and funny enough, just before you guys came on, on when we started chatting, AJ, who was the our producer on the show, he actually just rang me up from Australia, just out of the blue, he hadn't spoken for a year. And um, I was like, okay, shit, we well, we'll must have some memory of what happened last night. We still have our sort of cameras or iPhones or so we said, let's look at the footage of um, of the last thing we remember doing. <laughs> <laughs> but so we're scrolling through footage. It's just like, you know, I think this must have been the script to The Hangover before. <laughs> That's the Hangover. And, uh, so we're going through the footage. Oh, it's a nightclub. Jeez, oh, that actually, she's really hot. Look at it. Oh, my God. Where are we now? Oh, shit. shit. Next thing you know, um, AJ, this other guy, Walshie, I don't think I was, but maybe I was, but cause probably Brent must have been filming. We were, we were in this fountain in the middle of town and everyone's diving in it and we're swimming around in, in, in this fountain in the middle of the, in Florida there. Just totally chaotic stuff, really, really bad. And we go, fuck, whoa, shit, where is that? And we end up getting out of there, heading back into town and asking someone where this fountain is. And we, we find it, we find this fountain and all our credit cards and everything are still floating in the water. Like <laughs> there's like credit cards and there's bits and still all our TV kind of shit. We're grabbing stuff like this going, you know, in our pockets. And then the next then we jump on a cab and head off to this jetty where we jump on a boat. I don't know if we did jump on a boat. We just went through the motions of jumping on a boat um, to film our exit into the Bermuda Triangle. It did an interview with some guy. I was quite off my head for that. Um, but, yeah, it's amazing that we found all this stuff. That, and that was Florida, yeah. That was that was it. So that was the last. And you can, you know, you can see in our faces that that was toward the end of it. I don't know where the snake came from, though. I don't remember the snake. You know, it's quite funny. You've got a snake around you and a, a parrot, and you don't ever actually remember where that came from. <laughs> Steve, Steve and I are falling over ourselves to ask follow-up questions, but I'm going to butt in quickly just with that scene that you filmed in Miami. You're all wearing, like, South Beach booty shorts. And oh, I, yeah, I clocked yeah, it again yeah, yeah. I clocked yeah, it again yeah. last night, and I was just dying with laughter. It was, it was hilarious. Little, little, and now that you've explained yeah. what happened the night before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, think, oh, I think we're always going to do that. I'm not quite sure, but we must have got them from a – from a little sort of stool and make sure they're really small, those little toweling sort of shorts. Um, that's actually, I really like that episode because it is, it, I managed to, um, it worked exactly as we imagined. The, the trip was a debacle, which it kind of was, but we got some good footage. We managed to summarize the whole um, series. I managed to get Jace, Jason Hoyt to do a cameo after the fact, looking at footage as if trying to find where we've we'd gone. They added a bit of another element to it. No, it was it was a good good fun thing though, I tell you. Oh. It, it's uh, Mysterious Planet seems like I, I know you'd done a bunch of shows before then, but it almost seems like the perfect culmination of your skill. Like like the, the Bigfoot convention where you've got yeah. these these people talking about a crazy concept. You've got you doing your sort of your nonsense gags, your sort of you're talking, you've got the, the voiceovers, you know, it, it just seems like a, a perfect fit for your comedy. Yep. You couldn't say it better. As I say, it was my favourite series, you know. Um, it's never going to be sports cap, never going to be, it's never, you know, because of the, the timing, whatever. But in a personal way, it was my favourite show. And if I could do another series of all those, it would be that, A, because I love travel. But you did right because... You can use interview, which was a real sports cafe thing. You know, that's, you know, this interview is going so badly and this is funny. Something's happening bad in the background. Um, voiceover. Well, voiceover, finally, you can have reality stuff going on, um, you know, fake reality scenes about trying to book into a hotel like, you know, you would have on Spinal Tap. You can have, um, you know, slapstick stuff going on. Um, you can have archival footage that you chuck in there and finally <laughs> in your final edit it's not done yet you know it's not quite funny enough yet you still because the voiceover is always the last thing i write 
once you've seen everything, you, you've still got a, one chance to save it by, by writing something in the voiceover, you know, but then drama, you know, the hotel's cancelled again and they've got to do this, whatever. There's a, you, you can just take it in a weird direction. And um, a lot of the voiceovers for The Mysterious Planet, I'd watch those mysteries documentaries that UFOs or Bigfoot, whatever. I'd pretty much write the exact same script down first, you know, Bigfoot, you know, this mythical bipedal beast, you know, and you just write it and just rewrite it, you know, and just make it just as what's ridiculous anyway, but just make it that much more stupid. And I love the voiceover element. And then I think with, with um, the mysterious parent we use, you know, Daryl Harbrack, and he does a lot of voiceover stuff. Um, and he's got that dramatic voice, you know, Loch Ness, you know, what mysteries does it hold? You know, sort of, what the hell? <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And I, I love that because I've done all my part writing the script and he just adds this another bassy layer. They go, oh, shit, that's great. You know, um, when, when, when a series like that gets green lit, it must be the happiest day where, when you think, shit, we're going to get to go to these six countries back to Peru, your homeland, you're going to take a crew with you, you can be creative yeah. in all your ideas. Like, how does something like that actually get over the line? Is it a tough process to get that green light? Well, that was a fluke, that one. Um, I, we, we did another one first. With Moon TV, I got funding for Moon for one particular series. We, we, did, we did a whole, and I would never tell them, I will put a proposal in, and I'm not just saying this, and by the time we got funded, it would be three months later. And by the time we ended up making it another three months later, I would have changed my mind what the show was about anyway and just go and do that and not really tell them. they just deliver it. And I'd always get away with it because it was it kind of normally would work. But So we did it with Moon once where I said, stuff it, let's go overseas. Um, we'll just have to get a sponsor on board to help us with the travel. So it helps the travel. In that example, because they were the travel sponsor, this was the Moon series called In the Footsteps of Granite and Kenny where we went to Peru again, we went to Croatia, we went to weird places because we went to where they wanted us to go for their travel show. It had nothing to do with where the mysteries were there. <laughs> so that was, you know, what do you call it, egg and chicken kind of tail wagging the dog crap. Um, but in the case of, yeah, the um, Mysterious Planet, it was a, I, I put the proposal in a few months earlier. I had a good relationship with Sky TVNZ. And seriously what happened, they had budgets. And at the end of the year, they hadn't spent a certain amount of money and there's a sort of, um, it would have made their their books not add up kind of thing somehow. Don't, don't ask me how this works. So they sort of rang up and said, yeah, that was mysterious planet. Well, well, we might fund it. I said, really? Why the, why the change of mind? Well, don't ask, but we've got this bit of a problem here. In the <laughs> so it really was an accounting issue that ended up getting that show funded, I think. So, wow, oh, okay, we're not going to complain. We sort of ran with it. So shit, let's make it. But we're still doing it on pretty lean budgets compared to, you know, and it's not Michael Palin stuff where, you know, it was a real case of shit, that'll do and we'll make it work because we want to do it. And because we've got such a small crew, um, really it's only three or four of us making it, even on those international stuff, it was a pretty small crew. It still stacks up compared to normal crews getting 10, 20 people. Um, you know, I'm writing it, directing it in it, and we edit, we have a couple of cameramen, we all... We're all in boots and all. Everybody has to do a bit of everything, which is a lot of fun. Um, and it's more fun that way. And we can get away with it on a shorter budget and still probably make as much as someone who's 10 times the budget who's got 10 times the crew, which is just yeah. watering the whole concept down, you know? We've like, got, you've, got, you've got to do another one. There's got to be yeah. appetite for it. It's so good. It's so entertaining. Um, yeah, me and Shay will, will chip in. As I say, that was AJ that rang before. Um probably about something totally unrelated. But I like to think he was going, because he's he producing a whole lot of TV in Aussie now, a lot of reality stuff, and he's doing really well. I'm, I'm hoping he's just had enough of that, and he's going, when are we going to do another Mysterious Planet? Because he was great, because he was on camera the whole time. Remember AJ was just a little the little guy, um, and then he was the guy at Matthew Pichu that, you know, he's playing the, playing the pan flutes. <laughs> 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 and I go, don't play your fruity pan food tunes up here. You know, that, uh, that's AJ. He was kind of producing the show as he went. But you're going to be on screen if you're making something with me. You're going to be on screen. So get used to it. Yeah. Um, we're going we're gonna to prod around some of your other shows. We've got a whole bunch of questions, uh, like so many, th too many to ask. But um, the, one of the ones I wanted to start with was 
I was watching back a bunch of stuff on, on Moon TV last night, uh, and I was watching Late Night Big Breakfast and Olympico. And one of the questions was, how how much in on it were the guests? Were they were they prepped? You know, I was watching the one with Daniel Loder when you had it was you, Jeremy, Jace, and Daniel Loder at the London Olympics. And there was a question about, like, you know, uh, what do you think about the change of temperature in the pool that's like down half a degree on, on sort of, uh, Rome in 1964 or something? And yeah. he's either done a great job as an actor or he's just totally oblivious to it. And then there was another one on Late Night Big Breakfast where you've got guests in, it's like a psychic and someone falls through the roof and you're like, well, you didn't see that coming. <laughs> and it's like he, he's done a great job of selling that he's not in on the gag, but are they always in on the gag? No, it, it really is horses, of course, because you, you sort of, before it happens, you sort of wrestle with yourself, are we going to get a better result if I tell him what's going on so he doesn't feel uncomfortable and is he good good enough actor you know to pull it off and we get the same result or do we especially for the first joke because that's coming up first and we really need that legit reaction do we not because you can stop filming it's not live do we not tell him to after that kind of thing and then go oh shit sorry about that because we've got the best part then we go um hey by the way look it's going to get pretty weird but you know what it's like and and they get along they feel included then because what, what invariably does happen, though, because if they think they're coming on a comedy show, which is the worst thing for us, they literally try to, I'm not saying try to do comedy, but they lighten up and they try to do punchlines and stuff, and you go, no, oh, shit, I hate it. Because you're, you're going to have to edit that in anyway because you need them you need them to be totally straight talking about MMP, government system, for you to come in with a really simple question. Because if they're talking about, oh, it's so funny, man, it's being such a write-off, and you go, and you come in with a strike, it's not, it's not funny. You know, it, they've got to set you up, you've got to set them up. So it's really, I can go back to different guests, and I can remember if they were in it or not. Um, for example, but put this way, eventually I will make sure they're in on it if it was getting uncomfortable. If you know what I mean. But the other thing to remember is that. The fact that they're coming on that show, like late army breakfast or say moon TV by that stage, even if it's bloody um, Jacinda Ardern, she knows what sort of show it is, you know. So she knows there is going to be some comedy element, whether it's then or later, and they're playing along. But as long as they play along the right way and not try to be comedic, it sounds selfish to say that, you know, we're going to do the jokes, not you. But it's kind of how it has to be, otherwise it just doesn't work. Um, it, it doesn't feel the same. So the guy, when there's a psychic guy, I don't know if I should give this away because if it wrecks it, he was an actor, you know, and very good, you know. Yeah, yeah he was. He was very good. You know, I'll tell you about it, right? But he was very good. And not many people could have pulled that off because, but then again, editing helps too because whenever it looks like one of us or him has gone out of character, we, we pull that back or cut away from him as soon as he looks, he's looking like he's, that's the key actually. It looks like uh, his, his acting's not quite pulling it off. We cut away, you know, to someone else, a different question. So th- it's about, and often you'd be surprised how many times we take away Jace or Jeremy might say a real a funny line or a funny joke and I'll, I'll cut it out. <laughs> it seems so funny. No, no, but it's never, it's never because they don't seem so funny. Or I might say something that is, you know, oh, here, that's real funny. It's going to get a laugh at the moment or on set because it was, but it didn't help their overall three minutes of interview. The the whole interview became less believable because of that gag. So, shit, we've got to get rid of it, if you know what I mean. So that's the kind of thing. So I think editing is is the key. The worst one, you mentioned it, you mentioned it earlier. And stuff where people have seen this, and Brent didn't actually film this. It was the Formula One interview with this guy, Murray, um, Murray Walker, right? No, yeah. Um, and that's the first time, if we're going to go full circle on this, that I actually felt uncomfortable for what I did. I actually felt like one of those um, ambush reporters. Um, so the idea was he's this old guy, Formula One legend um, commentator. He's in New Zealand selling a book, and we got an interview with him for Sports Cafe in this hotel lobby. And I had a different cameraman. And I thought, okay, what are we going to do here? Can't just do the same thing. I thought, okay, why don't we make a story that I'm staying in the hotel, 
he doesn't know me from Bar of Soap. He's international, so he doesn't have any preconceptions of who the hell I am. So we can get away with this. I'm just another reporter. You've got my mate, Matt I, to pretend to be the concierge. But to do this, I thought, it's not going to work with one camera. We need to have two cameras the whole time. So I'm getting his reactions <laughs> real time to what I'm doing. And this is one example why I gave him no heads up at all. I didn't say, hey, by the way, you, you, you have no idea who I am, but I do this weird comedy sports show in New Zealand. Just play along with it. Trust me, it'll be right at the end of the day. You know, maybe if I did, it still would have worked. Um, but I didn't. I thought we just need to get his real reactions. Oh, God. Um, so, sure. And I was really nervous because this is happening in real time now. You know, this is, we can't, what happens, happens. So I'm, I say to Matt, look, you stand over there, give it a minute and a half. I've admitted to you, you wander over and you can see him in the back shot and start abusing me about soiling the hotel room or not paying the minibar bill or just whatever it was. So I'm saying, and I'm going, I'm shitting myself because I can see him coming and I'm still trying to stay in character. And and he rocks up and goes, have a good, <laughs> have a good night. It was hard, did you? You know, I'm oh, sorry, what we you know? Yeah, enjoy yourself in your room last night. And, and we've got this other cameras on, Murray Walker, who's just going. <laughs> and I don't think he couldn't have, there's no way if we had told him he could have acted that part, you know. He's going, and he really felt sorry for me. And I said, look, that's fine. And he buggers off. Then he comes back five minutes later, you've seen this for the inflatable doll, you know, and like sex doll. <laughs> You leave something in the room last night, did you, Mr. I go, oh, fuck, I'm trying to get together. And, oh, my God. And I can see him. He's really feeling awkward, you know, and this elderly gentleman. Oh, my God. And we get through the whole thing. Oh, my God. It's going to be funny. But his media liaison gets in touch with, with Rick at SportsCap and goes, we're really unhappy about that. We didn't realise this was an ambush spoof interview. And, you know, you felt like Borat, you know. And I felt real sick. And I said, well, look, tell him we won't run it. I don't care. We don't have to run at all. I sent him a bottle of wine. And so, look, you know, I said to Rick, I'm not comfortable. He, Rick was going, no, look, it's fine. Just run. I said, no, look, if, if he doesn't want it, we won't run it. I think we did run it, right? You must have seen it. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those ones that was yeah. hard. It wasn't the same. It was a weird part of the season. It didn't be, But in a weird way, it's one of my favourites. But it's the only time I felt uncomfortable about something I'd done mm. in an interview, to be honest. Um, yeah, because I premeditated the fact that if I if I explain too much up front, um, as it, maybe in New Zealand I didn't have to because they expected it. But if I explain too much up front, we wouldn't have got the same same yeah. result. I suppose you know. Yeah. The, in in the research for this, there's another one which I, I might have time stamped. Might have been time stamped. I don't really recall. But it was uh, that guy's rugby world cup, and it was when John Key came in, and you were talking about <laughs> strip clubs. Oh yeah, yeah. and yeah, I. Yeah. I watched it back. I watched it back, and when Jason Jason Hoyt is in the and the, this must be a precursor to the um the late yeah. night breakfast because it was very very similar style. Yeah. Um, but Jason sort of says, "No, I don't go to those sorts of places. I'm a family man." Deadpans it, and then it's sort yeah. of this very uncomfortable John Key sort of almost trying to backtrack but not really knowing. How to handle <laughs> it. It's such it's such good television. It's amazing, amazing well, it's, content. So John Key was an example of he knew he's in there. He's, um, what's the word for it, a media savvy enough, but also trying to get down with the kids. I'm going to get on the show and come across cool. So he's right on the cusp of trying to make jokes. Um, but at the same time, he could also play the dry card as well and, and be in character. So, no, he kind of had it just right. Okay, even just into Rodan, I mean, they, it's amazing how media savvy, um, not just media savvy, but almost comedy savvy, um, so many people, so many uh, mainstream sort of personalities are nowadays. You know, you can, you can, it's almost like you start interviewing them and they go into your mode by and large, you know, of what you expect. You know, um, it's almost like they've seen the edits and they, they almost, and it's a lot easier um, than it was back in the day because you, you did almost have to explain stuff to people um, a lot more. Yeah. The John Key was great. Politicians can be interesting because they'll either, They'll either, I mean, when they come on seven days, they're used to those kind of shows where they have to sort of back themselves and be, you know, they've got a banter with the comedians, this sort of stuff. Whereas, as I say, we don't really want that. We just want them to be themselves. Um, and as I say, the key for me is in the final edit, as long as the joke 
is on me or my show with Late Night Big Breakfast or the host of that show and not the guest, no matter who they are, unknown or, or famous, we're the ones that get locked to you because we didn't do our research or we've got the wrong guest or there's something else going on in the background. It's got to be our debacle and they're just the guest. And if they can get a good message across and whatever, whether it's, you know, Judith Collins, whatever, it doesn't matter. As long as we get what we want, you know, which is just, um, you know, a situation. We're trying to create a situation. I'd, I'd love to pick apart almost every part of the late night big breakfast, but I'll just hone in on one, which is always, it always makes me laugh. And you spoke about it or referenced it earlier, which is, which is breaking character. And it was, I think, the last episode of season three, the season that was on TVNZ, where Mike the Mongolian throat singer sung, <laughs> sung you out. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's yourself, <laughs> Jeremy Wells, and Jason Hoyt sitting behind yeah. him. Mike's, Mike's in front of you singing to camera, and you've actually oh, had yeah. to leave set because you were laughing so much. And, and oh. Jason and Jeremy stay. And I, I just, that, that was amazing again. Yeah, if I if I see other people laughing, like Jeremy's quite infectious for me. If I see him laughing, it gets me. It's happened a few times in the ACC uh, in, in the early days with the, in the caravan. We, it, it could happen, you know. Mike Mongolian, right? So how that came about? <laughs> we wanted an extra to be um, an Asian driver in an Asian driver skit where I'm. Who's a better driver, an Asian driver or a Pakeha driver? So, yeah. what a premise that is! I mean, imagine a normal, a normal breakfast show having that sketch or that story for a start. That's the comedy for me that you'd even get away with that ridiculous concept. Turns out he's a lot better than me. I take my door off, all this sort of stuff. But <laughs> cool. he was the he was the extra for that. And then somehow in conversation while we're having lunch, he goes. Because all these extras have these sort of CVs that go, I do this, this, and this. Oh, I can, I can, I can ride horses. I can do this. I can drive cars. Um, I do Mongolian throat singing. And um, I don't know how it happened. One of us noticed that or mentioned it. We went, what? Well, do you want to do something? <laughs> and he, he had his costume there. And the next thing you know, okay, you're a guest. So we had no, I didn't even know what that was. We had no idea what we we're going to see. So we went with the prep. So. So it was great. So, so the next thing you know, he's there and ooh, he starts singing and we're going, and he's just slowly, just we're slowly melting and just get, you know, he just get one look from someone and go, and it just becomes harder and more and more intense. I just couldn't handle it. I had to leave. Um, <laughs> I could have stayed there, I suppose, because you just sort of cut away from me, I suppose. But I remember, as I say, the, the whole theme of this, when we're editing the show, we had two versions. Because I remember thinking, is this funnier if we are straight ass? You know, we're totally, we, could have, we could have edited that way. There was enough shots where we were just going, so we're totally dry ass. This guy is awesome. He is the best singer ever. You know, <laughs> nothing wrong with him. The audience at home thinking, this is the most horrendous shit I've ever heard. But we're going, well, there you go. True talent there. You know, that for me is hilarious. But there was something so infectious about seeing us laugh. I was going, oh, fuck it. And so I think we ended up doing one version, because it was in two episodes, one version where we yeah, kept it right. all together. And then in the final episode, because it was the final episode and we're sort of letting it go and see you later, we just played the real reactions, I suppose. And, and it's great to see that stuff. And I don't mind showing that because it was real. You know, when you see people like Jace, who's straight as and Jeremy, you look at he's on seven sharp and right straight out and you know literally have tears running down the face and you literally uh, are holding your cock because you're so you gotta stop. It's hard to keep that out of the edit, you know. And then, and he's trying to and he's singing it and going and he starts laughing as I'm going, Oh my God, what is this? You know <laughs> your your comedy is um so unique to you it's so wacky and crazy and it's so your own brand when you get an idea like the hamster man from amsterdam do you do you bounce that off other people or do you just do you just back yourself and think fuck this is going to be funny and then put it out there and sort of see how it goes like what's the process when you have an idea like how many of these ideas are on the scrapping room floor versus pretty how many much, no no pretty much you don't bounce that much I, i've even tried things where you know 
I always feel guilty of not involving enough other people in a strange kind of way. And I've even done things where I take my, my brother and a few mates over to, to a think tank, the wine heck, and I'll, I'll put on the beers. And we end up coming back three days later with absolutely nothing. A whiteboard with, with some abuse about something, and that's it. And and then I'll end up doing it anyway. But like talking to my brother just on a, you know, just as mates, he somehow not just doesn't give me ideas, but, you know, he puts my brain on a different path. Brent, he doesn't give me ideas at all. And he wouldn't mind me saying that. But now he's a very good sounding board for an immediate kind of reaction to something. But if I think something I think is going to work, I'll, I'll go for it, you know. Um, yeah. I don't. You, know, you don't start um, dissecting it and try to sort of workshop too much or what do you think? Because before you know it, before you know it, you talk your way out of it. You go, yeah, it is pretty shit. Hamster man, imagine running that through a think tank for two days. You'd come away with motivated patrol again. You know, it's, it has to be what it was. And that came about from, so I was making a moon series and we, we needed more segments. And down the road from where I was living um, on Dominion Road there, was this pet store that I used to go sometimes and grab, <laughs> I don't know, dog food or something. And there's this guy in there and he ran the place and well, no disrespect to him, but he was a, he was a, he was a cool guy. But I was I mean, how the hell does this guy make money? No one's ever in here. And he sort of seemed, I don't think he really drank or anything like that, but he kind of looked like he would. You know what I mean? He's a sort of, sort of a wasted looking guy, but you know, he's a really nice guy, whatever. But I thought, fuck, that's almost a reality show, you know, because I was so embedded with TV by that stage in my way, the all these sort of reality. That was the peak of reality shows. Imagine a reality show about a guy that runs a pet store and nothing <laughs> ever happens in the pet store. Let's take it to the nth degree. Let's take it from motorway on the motorways into a pet store where you've got the front of the store and the back of the store, and that's what you've got, you know. And what drama. The same voiceover guy that does motorway patrol does this, you know, but then drama. He's got no pallets for the day. He's going to close early kind of thing. And we literally went down there that day and said, do you mind if we just bring a camera in and um, walk around and we just don't mind your customers. We'll just film and slowly get into it. And we just started filming little scenes. Next thing you know, we had a whole little segment of this guy called the hamster man, you know. Um, and he didn't care. He just, he just didn't really care. For some reason, I thought he was an alcoholic. He comes in there and we, he drinks and um, he doesn't know what he's doing. It's just, he's probably the most tragic character, I suppose, ever come up with in many ways. And I think people feel sorry for him, you know. Yeah. He's very much a sort of, a, you know, he's a likeable guy somehow, Hamster Man, because he's, I don't know, he's, he's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, w I want to move you into the, the radio stuff. I've got a really um, distinct memory of driving to Taranaki, and I think you were doing the Saturday show uh, with, with Jace, and it was only an hour at the time, and I remember mm -hmm. I had to tune in for the hour of Bouja. It was so different to anything else on the radio. It was like appointment listening for fans of, of yourself and Jace. And the chemistry you guys had and the ability to play off each other was just just unbelievable, and and... It was rewarded, I guess, with the drive show. But how, how quickly did you get feedback from whoever the, the boss was at the time that you've actually got this this huge cult following growing, which is turning into a really mainstream well, radio following? Again, it was kind of a sort of a, a, a process. So how that came about, and I don't mind if, um, well, no one's going to, but if someone wants to correct me on this, but... It came about from the ACC um, asked me to come on as one of their hosts on the ACC on the cricket thing. By that stage, I was working quite a lot with Jace like, on Moon TV and stuff, right? And I really liked working with him. So I said, cool, can, can Jace come on? They said, yeah, should you? That'd be great. Turns out he's a really good cricket commentator and <laughs> we need to cricket him. <laughs> Ten times better than me, anyway. So they hit the jackpot with that. But so we ended up being, you know, as part of the ACC team, the two of us, and that was working quite well. And I think what how these things work literally really are sometimes. Um, I, I hate to say it, but I think rival radio station almost said, 
do you want to come and do a radio show? And I think I mentioned it to NZME, which was doing the AGC, and they said, and they freaked out about that and said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you guys do a Saturday show then here? If they doing that, I said, oh, shit, okay. I, hadn't really, I didn't really do it in that way. I just, I, you know, so next thing you know, we're doing the Saturday show for an hour. And they want it to be like a sports show on the back of the ACC stuff. But naturally, we're so excited. We're the sport. And we're doing, I, I, just, I was listening to one the other day, actually. Something was really, it was really funny. Um, we didn't talk about sport the whole time. We went off on that. It was just admin. <laughs> it was a whole <laughs> of admin about to talk about sport and this stuff and not knowing anything. And then see you later. You know, and it was, it was, it was, you know, and then from that, they said, oh, shit, well, I think that was working quite well. So they said, why don't you do the hour before the drive show? I think Mikey, Mikey Havoc was at the drive show that stage. So we'll do three to four, I think. And then I think Mikey left or something happened. So they said, okay, well, now you've got the drive show. So it was just kind of a comedy of errors in a way, or like an escalation of stuff, um, which was great. And really funny times um i really i don't i do miss it but i don't miss it if you know what i mean um it was just the timing of it was all the other stuff you're doing so for the drive show we're doing what, what four till seven it's not that long is it each day to call that a job but the problem was we're calling it a job so it meant you couldn't just bugger off to the South Island and film a TV show for two weeks or a week or go and film something for two days without jerking a lot of other people around. So mm. although the hours themselves went long, the um, it's worth it, the restriction. Yeah, it's sort of the restriction. And obviously we could pre we could do the odd thing where we could take days off or pre-record the odd segment here, but you always felt like I was jerking someone around and asking permission all the time to stay out, you know, but shit, I've got a TV project. So what I noticed about myself was that I had these TV ideas and none of them were getting done. And you, oh, that'll be fine, I'll do that next month, whatever. Next thing, a whole year's gone. Where did that time go? And, you, and sure, you've done another whole year of radio, which was always good and I, I don't regret it. And it was so fun, especially the sort of extracurricular radio stuff that goes with it, but which is probably getting slightly too well for anyway. Um, <laughs> So kind of had to, yeah. And Jay's felt the same way at the time, because um, he's less of a. I'm not going to say social person. He's certainly social, but they're not. Um, he certainly didn't enjoy the travel of radio. You know, the sort of let's go down to Christchurch with the ACC and Haraki and and do this and do this and let's well, let's party till till dawn till midnight or midnight to do this sort of stuff. You know, I kind of don't mind that too much within reason, but. Um, that was a, a struggle for him. Um, on air together, we're totally fine, but it would be no, we got to a stage where I realised there's going to be no prep on this, you know. I, I, I was quite used to say late night breakfast. Shows like this, especially TV, I, you know, as you alluded to, I, I, I don't take quite seriously. So I don't have a whole lot of ideas. The video of Jace, um, he won't so much come with ideas, but what you give him, he can just deliver so well. It's it's brilliant. Uh, so I'd never give him lines to say, but it'll be a gist. I'd say the idea is we're talking about um, Pavlova, but somehow we're going to get into World War Two history, you know, in front of a you know a guest. You know. Well, it's very much a it's, it's a pre it's a post nineteen thirty nine cake in many ways. I mean. Uh, <laughs> Was coming in, you know, from Poland, <laughs> on this one, you know, and and he gets the gist, and he can run with that so much better than me, you know, his master language kind of stuff. But with radio, I was like, should we have a prep for a session? Should we meet once a week beforehand? We'll come up with a whole lot of ideas, and you know, and then we maybe pre-record some stuff, take some pressure off. And he was never really kind of into that, and I realized, okay. So once we realized that, we said, "Fuck it, that is the show." The show, if it wasn't called Bougie, it should be called No Prep Radio and we're on a tightrope and see what happens, you know, and hence sometimes we'd laugh, sometimes we'd fail catastrophically, but I think that tension was maybe what made it maybe listenable, you know, where's this going to go? You know, we're not saying it was brilliant radio um, all the time or maybe any of the time, but it, that tension of... 
basically, Jace would go, all hear them write, <laughs> the start of a show was, get out of New Zealand, he'd write down the date and the time, and uh, get out of New Zealand, welcome to, uh, yeah, it's Tuesday, the 24th of March, and welcome to uh, Bougie, and we're very happy, and he'd go, yeah, and I'd go, yeah, thanks, Jace, great show, great show, what have we got coming up? <laughs> oh, that's great, good question, Lee. we've got a lot of great stuff coming up, how are you feeling? Right, good. What are we coming up? Well, we're after the break, I'll tell you about that. But, you know, it becomes this sort of, it should be called hospital pass radio. You know, it's like just, <laughs> you know. But, um, and he's still doing it now with, with Mike, I think, you know, on, on the oh, yeah. thing. It's good, you know, I like it. It's really cool. So, yeah, I, I miss it, but I don't miss it, you know. Um, I wouldn't change anything right now, but, yeah. Yeah, it's it's certainly. You've, um, it's a great, right, radio a is a great release. It's a great release um, from when you're not making TV or writing stuff to be able to just go out and spew a whole lot of shit um, out was quite cool. My regret was that we didn't write more of it down, or I know we've recorded a lot and I've got to get hold of those. Because as I say, I'm not, I'm not saying I recycle stuff, but there's so many wasted gags on radio because it's so immediate, you, you'll do a gag um, and that's it. And the next, shit, that could have been, that could have been turned into a whole 20 minutes of TV if, you know, if we, if, you know, that could be the, of a script. So I'm, I'm more likely to sort of get that stuff and go, okay, let's see if we can take that sort of further, if you know what I mean. You, you've referenced Radio Hodaki and the ACC there. And yeah. for me, it's this, amazing melting pot of like my favorite things that i watched growing up you jeremy wells with eating media lunch yeah. um matt heath with back of the wine masterpiece television yourself on sports cafe i even watched jason with sugar and spice on pulp comedy yeah. way back when and you bring all these characters into into one one sort of place and shake them all up and it's just electric for steve and i we always sort of said it's like a group of mates just hanging out and you're yeah. eavesdropping on their on their conversations. It, it is weird. Incredible times. Because I remember back in the while I was on when we were um, making a TV, so we didn't really have a lot to do them because we're doing our own show. It's like different bands, if you know what I mean. And Jeremy, of course, was doing Eat Me Lunch, and I used to love that. And there's all this sort of stuff going on. And it's weird to think that we would all end up at the bottom of a sieve somewhere, <laughs> you know, making stuff together, which is really cool. And we've actually brought that up with talked you know, I'm, I'm all big fan. I'm big fans of all their work, and I love Matt and Jerry's show in the morning at the moment now a lot more than I did say when I was on radio because a, I hadn't listened to as much when I was um, on the drive show because just through timings. But now that I'm not on radio, my timing works better than I actually do listen to their show more, and I really like it. You know, it's it's, it's great to better say you're a fan now as opposed to, a, say, a competitor or, or what they're doing, how come they're getting more funding than us on how I can? Oh, hold on, you know. Uh, you, know there's, there's, you know, sometimes you can get caught up in your own corral with this one little team. Um, but you sort of you start looking at little politics and they go, well, how come we're not doing that giveaway? You know, you know, why don't they announce that giveaway on our show? Instead, you know, it's what a petty thing to care about, you know. But what I mean is... Now you remove yourself from it, you know, it's great to be able to listen to people's shows. I was the other day, only two days ago, I think, driving home from somewhere and I had Harry on the drive, listening to something that Mike and Jason were talking about. And I was, I was cracking up, you know, I was saying, that's fucking fine. You know, whereas normally I'd think, oh, yeah, that's a bit of You know, <laughs> that's, that's your instinct, isn't it? But I was thinking, that shit sounds really funny, you know. I won't tell them that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> they can the podcast and find out. Yeah. Has your sense of humour evolved or changed much in the last 10, 20 years? Like, are there some things you don't joke about now that you would have before or some things you find not funny no, now? I don't think so. It's probably devolved. Um, no. No, the only, the, only, the only way it's changed and um, no, I don't think, I don't think that my sense of humour has changed and uh, this sounds really depressing. Uh, you've just got lazier. Like, it would take a lot for me to get off my ass and go to a speed cracking now. You know, uh, you know, it's literally, I wouldn't, it's, I suppose it is an age thing, but 
Uh, uh, you know, but what makes me laugh hasn't changed, or what I find funny hasn't changed, or what I imagine to be funny hasn't changed. But my execution has changed. Whether I'd bother, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on a plane and and do another mysterious planet, travel around the world, as hard as that would be, no worries at all. But to get up, I hate putting fake moustaches on that sort of stuff. So even if you notice things like. Um, even book time or book zone used to do with Joe Bennett. Started off with a sort of a yep. uh, <laughs> the week. Stuff and yeah. I said, oh, fuck it. I can't be fuck putting that on. It's either funny with that or it isn't. It's either funny what we're saying. I used to the admin of comedy has changed me. I just you know, David Brent hasn't got a wig on. Uh, so I'm, you know, just uh, if we need props to make it funny, it's not that funny. But which isn't always the case, by the way. Sometimes you have to get a character to, to make it. But like I said, I, I've probably got a speed cooking in me. But I'll wake up one day and do it. But I don't get up like I would five years ago and go, fuck it, I'm going to show them. And I'm going to make the most ridiculous uh, comedy show ever. I'm going to top. I used to, I used to get off on topping what we did the last time, you know what I mean? Um, and somehow... Uh, through laziness or age or whatever, I'm not. No, shit, I don't know how to explain it. Um, I think maybe there's other shit going on, but I will hopefully they'll come back. But I want to. Comedy seems to be a lot more subtle now. Um, he says that, she says that, you know. Whereas sometimes you, you've got to go, you know what? They need to be hit between the eyes and you do need a speed cooking or a, a full on scene that does take a bit of effort and does take a bit of organising and um, I think we've got to sort a few other things out on, on the periphery of all that and get back to that, you know. Mm. You know, and I'm, you know, I'm keen to do that, but whew, it's tough. <laughs> I've got to- I'm going to move uh, on to your, your business ventures very soon. I just want one ACC story before we do. Uh, I messaged Mike Lane. I said, look, we've got Lee Hart coming on the podcast. What's the story that, that we need to get him to tell? He said, uh, requesting medical attention from the Black Caps medical team during an ODI at University Oval in Dunedin as a result of tearing his hamstring from the night before mid-crossing George Street with kebab in hand. Mm, okay. Okay. Um... I'm not sure if he's got it quite right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that was the that was the heyday of the ACC, um, and that was the picture. This twelve hours after that, or maybe eight hours after that, we're in the little caravan commentating that game. Both Mike Lane and I are both flat on our backs at the back of the caravan. Me, maybe because my hamstring, but Mike, because he was so literally wasted and hung over. <laughs> you know, so he, you know, this is what we're dealing with. But that night we'd been into a few bars, staying in this place, and if I remember rightly, yeah, I, I think I was running across the road to get the kebab. Not, I didn't have the kebab already. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe I had the kebab and I was running back with the kebab. But I seemed to think, I, oh, I, I, I think I was, like, kebab, and I went like that and suddenly, you know, as a top athlete would, who hasn't warmed up, suddenly pulled my, my I was going to say my kebab string, my, my hand string, <laughs> and, and got the kebab. But I do remember that night, um, it was quite a steep street, not Baldwin Street, whatever, but it was a steep street that our, our little motel was in, our hotel. And I do remember Mike Lane was crawling up that street on his hands and knees and <laughs> To get to the, and I'm limping, and for some reason, but he hasn't pulled he hasn't pulled his hamstring, but he is crawling up the street at like this. Um, that's to, to you know, in my defence. But yes, um, that was that was the heyday of the ACC. I'd like to I'd like to think, you know, of course, after that we had a lot of the bar calls with the um, drinks trolley and and um, Hawks Bay and all that sort of stuff and. Um, we had the getting kicked out of Eden Park and losing our accreditation to the World Cup, and all these things were going on at the same time. It was a really, really funny time. The ACC. Um, Before we the uh, rock and roll train, we go full circle this conversation when I talk about getting deported from France for being in a rock and roll band and being cool. That was kind of cool then. 
I didn't expect to be in a rock and roll band commentary team 20 fucking five years later and go through the same stress. You know what I mean? Like, I'm too old for this shit, you know. I don't need this. You know, it's, and, and as I say, that's it does take it out of you, you know. Um, but, yeah, no, that was very, very good times. Yeah, Mike's Just, done a great um, job. Speaking of Mike Lane, I listened back to, to his episode with us in preparation for this, and I don't know if if the if the rock and roll band ever ever did this, but um, the guess the commentator's perineum. Where did you stand on 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 that gag? Oh, well, uh, it's a weird one. You see, we're all different personalities, right? So I would always be coming away from these things, like doing the commentary trying to do, again, the straight face dry stuff. And so was Jason, in a way. We'd, we'd be talking about, um, yes, well, you know, you try to be in the same peculiar things and, you know, whatever. But it was always Mike that took it to an extreme level. Like, um, um, and on reflection, it needed that. So what would happen, um, which people seem, seem to forget, there might be five of us rostered on that particular game, okay? And you sort of rostered, you might do, I don't know, seven overs each, and there's like some quasi white board with your name on it. You're always looking at it because you always get it wrong. And that means you can go off and get a get up some hot chips or go get a beer or go meet a mate in the stand and go, oh, shit, eighth over, I better get back. I'm, I'm on in a minute. But the problem is when you get back, you've got no idea where the tangents are. So, but as soon as you jump back on, you go, oh, and they go, welcome to the booth again, Lee Hunt. Yeah, thanks, my dear. Welcome back here. Yeah, back where I over here. Um, your perineum, where would you say? Well, you go, what the fuck? It's, it's like this hospital class that comes from nowhere. And obviously everyone's, everyone's off in this conversation. And you've just been, you just chuck the seat, just take it to another level. And then it goes to another angle and some other guy, you know, Lee Baker will come back and he's got to deal with the question like, yeah, so you have you ever had um, sex with uh, with a woman with um, you know? And you go, oh my god, it, it's, it's just, it was quite bizarre. But it was always Mike that would take it to. Um, I, I was going to say too far back in the day. In retrospect, kind of wasn't really. It's kind of what it needed. Um, I remember the funniest story that made that cracked me up was Jeremy Wells' story. Um, Is this about the foot, the foot finish? No, he had sex with a girl with um, oh, there was some condition. Um, oh, it just sounds horrible to bring someone up, um, but it's you know you have to sort of remove yourself and go. Am I listening to the medical channel or is it a, is it a cricket commentary? It's just this weirdest, hey, you've got some. It's a cross between Jerry Springer and the medical channel and occasionally a little bit of cricket. And then you've got some like Jay's coming in and coming from the um, bullets in now, so, you know, and coming in with some serious cricket. And for me, that's what, again, going back to, you know, we're getting the theme here, going back to the comedy of it, that's why it worked for me because. Between Matt, sorry, between Jeremy and Jace, with their pretty much serious on the on the button com type commentary that sounded very legit, it could, could be coming from you know radio sport or you know from cricket commentary people. Um, that's why it works because it's this um, yin and yang thing where you go and yes and um, and the little signal off to the offside there. And yeah, so back to the Pyrenean chat there, John. You know, it, 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 that's, but, but if you just had, if you didn't have that cricket yeah. element to it and just had the Pyrenean and stuff, it basically it's just a sort of a crude podcast, you know what I mean? But if you have that, it gives it that sort of structure that makes it, for me anyway, really funny. You know, and I don't know if Mike might be saying this, but he kind of knows, but when, when that, in a way, when they started doing some, you know, a lot of them stuff, rugby, that's not something, but everything else, it, it lacked the, the really formal structure of cricket for me that actually gave the random yarns their little, the nuanced kind of stuff where you just don't have to say that much and it's really funny. It's that whole thing about fighting in church, you know. You don't have to do much and it's really funny, you know, because it's all mm. sort of formal, you know, and then someone farts and goes, you know. But if, if you just basically, oh, it's all over the show, um, but look, Mike knows I know that, but you know, I, I certainly I think it's great. But 
I think all I'm trying to say is I love structure and then breaking away from it because those some of those random I'm trying to think what Jerry was talking about some of those random yarns um, that would come off because that's the other thing too because no matter where you were in the yarn right. You go, yeah, I'll tell you what, in the motel, well, there was two girls there, but the thing I said was coming, and coming from the bollards end now, because you'd have to <laughs> just as, and it's just like, just as you get in the good bed, and then, then they're having goes, yeah, and then what happened was, it's <laughs> just that, for me, that is just perfect. It's just like this weird, um, weird sort of, sort of stuff, especially the bowlers, because you've got so little time, this, sorry, the spin bowlers, so little, little time to tell a yarn, you, you, you know. So if I had a good yarn, you actually learned a little bit. In, in a way, because if I had a yarn that I knew was going to be oh, this need, I need to embellish this, I'd say I'm going to wait till I've got a pace ball. <laughs> you, you can't do that stuff with the spin bowler because it goes, yeah. yeah. And then Barry, you know, sort of, oh, sorry, and then but you know it needs you need the momentum, you know. So even I learned a bit about that. And the fact that those guys are all quite good at cricket, they're really into it. Where I wasn't really, you know, added an element because. I'd bring in something like, you know, um, something about the guy, you know, what's his name? Um, um, who didn't, who was the wet weather guy? Um, shit. Uh, well, just random characters of, of cricket that I'd sort of met in the past that don't sort of exist, you know, fictitious kind of people. <laughs> um, whereas these guys can talk confidently about cricket, right? You know, be, you know, yeah. No, it was certainly that. And again, another great release that was that whole um, experience, I think. Very cool. Very good. Um, the, the the other thing I, I just want you to briefly touch on, I, I feel like we need to address it. When when you when the ACC lost their accreditation at the World Cup, that I mean, Mike talked about it in our podcast about like that sort of blew the ACC in the sort of stratosphere. It was like all that yeah. publicity surrounding it. You were the face of that. Did, was that good for your brand too? Did, did you find that you sort of blew up as a result of that or were you already big into that? That was kind of... No, I don't think it... Um, I don't think it helped my so-called persona at, at all. If anything, I was a little bit worried um, that I would be perceived as like that um, Java guy, that, you know, some sort of, um, what do you call it... Um, what do you call those guys that just goes in there and, oh, it's all about me, I'm going on the field. And, you know, it yeah. was certainly not what I was about. And it might, might have explained. We, we got invited on the pitch and it was, it might have been me, it might have been anyone, it depends what over it was. They said, one of you guys can come on the pitch with the drinks, Charlie, um, in the, what's the name, over. Oh, okay. And it turned out, oh, sorry, can't do this over. Do you mind if it's a four overs time? So it ended up being me. So I don't care. Lee, do you mind doing it? Yeah, sure, mate, if it helps. So I jumped on the trolley, go out there, stand out there and give the drinks, talk, come back. Problem was, ACC was getting quite popular and all the other um, commentary teams were starting to complain to the ICC who were quite strict about this stuff and how come those guys got accreditation to go out there. So it was an absolute political thing. It had nothing to do with what we did on the field. Or was he was he talking to the players about something? What the hell? Like Matt's fixing or something like yeah, like you got to do that with me. You're like yeah, what the hell? So, so that annoyed me that I it actually annoyed me that I was the face of it. I would have preferred it was someone else. I didn't want to be the face of the. It doesn't do my reputation any good that oh yeah, Lee Hart tried to get on the on the Black Caps pitch because he you know actually if it was if it would have been Matt Heath it was two overs earlier, um, but. I've also thought it was pretty pathetic how it came about from the other from the other media and, and the whole thing, and then also to be honest, how we had to um, accept with NZME because NZME didn't want to lose their rights with the ICC, so they had to sort of really cower to them and chuck some sacrificial lambs out there, which was the ACC, and by default me, um, so I had to become the sacrificial lamb with no kind of, um, you know, sorry, mate, but we're going to have to do it. It's almost like they didn't even accept that we were in the right, you know, and me just said, oh, you know. So that kind of annoyed me. And Mike probably has not I hope he tells the same story. But it was around about the same time there was another incident at Eden Park, which I was kind of more concerned about, and the whole thing got blurred together. 
But um, yeah, no, it didn't. And I don't think it changed. Um, I don't think it changed my so-called profile at all. It certainly, it certainly boosted the ACC for sure. I think so. That was the that was a great moment for the ACC. I think yeah. after that, it was you know it was it was great. Um, but it could have been any of us, you know. It could have been Matt, Jerry, Mike. You know, wouldn't have mattered. Um, yeah. Oh. I want to move on to the to the business side of things. Um, from the outside, it looks like the transition, I don't know if you call it a transition, has been an incredible success. It seems like the beer is doing so well. The chips, as we've already talked about, huge hit. You've got the RTDs coming out. Is it Has it gone as well as it looks from the outside? Like, are you a super successful businessman? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so at all. Um... Again, uh, comedy areas, and it, I think it's hey, why you do things. So I never did anything to sell shit, you know. I'm going to try and make all the money. Um, I think the first thing I got into, say, say, was the beer, and that was a that was a case of you go to the Wellington Sevens, you know, sort of seven eight years ago, and there were shitloads of people dressed up in speedo cop uniforms or you know even hamster man uniforms and stuff like that, which is really cool, and you go. It's really fantastic. But, you know, we don't have a TV show coming up for another six months, so you kind of feel like not how do I capitalise on that? Because that's, that's, I don't mean financially, but how do you keep that story of that interest of these people bothering to do that? How do you keep that Halloween vibe carrying on until to the next show? Because we don't know when the next show is going to be. Is there some way of keeping things going without making TV? Is there a way to keep the, the in, you know, uh, I suppose you'd say social media would be the way to do it back then. But um, so I thought, well, I don't know, maybe we'll start a beer brand which has the same attitudes of the, sort of the TV and the stuff that we're doing. So it was literally in the in the office one day and we were, you know, in the process of making a show. We well, um, only had three staff at the time and I remember going, come on, start a beer brand. I went, oh, okay. Um, and I'm quite, what's the word for it, impulsive. So I just went on Facebook and wrote, going to start a beer brand, might call it Wacky Changi, which was an old term from the, you know, old sports cafe story. And it just sounded stupid and there's a Changi beer and Singapore and sort of stuff. So it sounded like a beer. And it just went off. The post had about 10,000 comments kind of thing. That's back in the day when Facebook was like, man, I went, shit. And it was one of those situations where, you know, where you call your own bluff, when, oh my God, I've, got, I've kind of got to do it now. I said, shit, now what I'm doing, they're going, I don't know. So I ended up bringing up breweries around the country. I said, look, you know, if I was going to do a beer, how would you do it? They said, well, we've got beer. You just have to rebrand it and this sort of stuff. So that's what we did. There was a beer in Christchurch, the Harrington's Brewery. We did that. We tried to get it out before uni, you know, the university thing. And that kind of worked. And it actually got really successful as a brand, but we were buying beer at a certain price and selling it for this, you know, this literally no money in that. So I kind of shut it down before it lost money. And then a year later, I thought I'll start it again. And McCash and Spurry and Nelson got in touch and said, look, we might come in on this, which in other words, we'll go 50-50. We'll be the beer manufacturer's distribution and you just have to market it. And some shit that suits me. Um, and that's exactly what happened. So that really worked. And, and, and wouldn't have worked otherwise, you know what I mean, without, without their involvement. Um, and then from that, did the chip. So that was that was through boredom of I was, if I don't have it, like the beer's going well, it's, it's ticking away. But you can't just keep putting a post out there that goes, hey, man, Lee here, um, <laughs> you know, drink Wacky Changi, you know, hey, drink, you know, they go, oh, shut up, will you? Oh, you know, it's great. <laughs> you need another story the whole time, like, and the story I wanted was for coming out in cans. And it was taking about two years for McCashins to get their canning line and to do that. So I kind of felt a little bit useless and preaching to convert it all the time. So, so I said, oh, shit. That, that's when I approached um, Griffins about doing chips to try and get it, you know, keep, and that, that really worked and that's sort of taken off. Um, and then the RTDs, a bit of a comedy areas as well, you know, beers takes a hit from all the RTDs. I wanted to start RTDs about three years ago. But we didn't have the canning line, so Powell's and all these big names have got in there before. So I thought, you know, this sort of thing. But you know, you can't beat them, join them. What's the attitude of that one? 
So that's where RTD came from. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, no, so there's been no sort of um, shit, I'm going to set myself up and become some kind of quasi businessman or anything. It's purely being not trying to maximize things out of the public or consumers, more trying to maximize what you've got or your time as best you can, if you know what, saying, if you know what I mean, or try, put us away. I'm not going to start up a, a, um, a running shoe brand or, um, or a, you know, hey, Lee Hart um, phone connections or, you know, or phone, you know, it's got to be the way I imagine it. You've got to be standing at a barbecue and if you can reach that product, that might work because you're not going to buy, I don't think you're going to buy um, red wine from me, are you? Who would buy red wine from me? I wouldn't do it, you know. Um, that was Al, that's Al Brown's red wine, by the way, his new red wine. Ah, yeah. Tipping point. Tipping point's good. Get him on your show. He's great. Um, but he, um, what, what, what I'm trying to say is it's very, no, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to do that. The chips was a, what, what do you have a beer? Oh, you might have nuts or chips. Let's do chips. Um, I do Hellas sausages anyway, which I've done for 20 years almost now. So I might do sausages, you know, under my own name. But if, as I say, if you can reach it from the barbecue, it feels on brand. As soon as you start going, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this, no, nah, you jump in the shark. It's bullshit, you know, don't, don't do it. You know, if you don't believe in it, don't, don't do it. Speaking of... Um managing your brand very savvy idea when you're producing your own content to retain those rights because moonflix.co.nz is an incredible archive to go back into the the history books of al almost yeah. everything you've ever created oh totally but there's so much stuff we still got to add on there we just don't have the time this it's i think only about half is there at the moment but again i think I probably used the, the, the phrase comedy barriers about five times in this podcast. It was a conscious thing, but not a conscious thing. So in the very beginning, when I first got a TV show, say with TVNZ, I said, oh, yeah, whatever. We're going to put it on at 11.45 at night. All right? I said, really? Well, can't it be at 10? What's better than that show? No, no, 11.45. But by default, by doing that, I said, okay, well, you obviously don't really care about it. Um, that's fine. It means you don't really care about the rights to it. I can keep the rights to it. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, you do what you want, this sort of stuff. So so you go, okay, so you do. And not, not to think they're really worth anything. I'm not saying they are worth anything. But the fact after that was, okay, I ended up appreciating the fact that you end up getting shafted in the beginning because, you know, if you use an example, you know, Jeremy, you know, you know, or Love, He's got no rights whatsoever to EDB Lunch, all those shows. They're TVNZ shows. They, TVNZ put far too much money into that, not far too much, the right amount of money into those shows. But the producers don't own any rights to those sort of shows. Whereas my stuff, they put no money, stuff or money into. But by default, I own every piece of footage I've ever sort of done, um, which is almost like, you know, owning a garage full of dog food. But, you know, it, <laughs> the point is it, it, it might be worth something at some point. But the, it's a good feeling owning it, if you know what I mean. I can use it whenever I want or, you know. But, yeah, I think that's important, you know, and anything you do, um, don't oversell it. Don't, don't let people just give you too much up front um, if they're not that invested in it just so they've got it. And then for the rest of your life, you can't use it. And they, don't, they can't be bothered using it. It's just stuck in a drawer. That's what happens, you know. And um, that's what kind of happened for a while with footage with us. Um, I still owned the rights, but I couldn't broadcast it anywhere because the internet wasn't huge. And I had TV shows just sitting in TV and Z drawer that had already been filmed and they hadn't bothered airing it. They, it's just stuck there. I was going, when the hell are you going to air this? And I couldn't apply for more funding because New Zealand and Air would say, well, when's your other show you're going to go to air? I said, well, I don't know. I talked to TVNZ. So they just put you in a sort of rock and a hard place. So, look, you're better off just going. So I kind of I wouldn't say got suspicious of New Zealand and air funding or that sort of stuff. It's just that if you can get the funding yourself somehow, um, it's kind of better, 
you know. Um, little, yeah. little d- double banger to help sort of tie a, a knot on this. Um, looking back now, so we started at, at Sports Cafe. It was sort of 25 years of comedy. We've talked through the incredible body of work. Um, when you look back, are you really proud of what you've achieved? And is there anything you would change? And looking forward, what are you still in the mindset of, of creating things for the future? Um, um, am I proud? Yes, but in a very um, critical, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, how do I say? It? Yeah, no, I'm definitely proud of it. Um, in a very humble way, in the sense that I'm, I'm probably proud of elements of it that are less um, was worth it. I'm, I'm proud of the stuff that people don't know about. The fact that I managed to get it made, the fact that I pulled that off, the fact that I could pull those people with me and we got it done, the fact that we bothered to go overseas when most people said they wouldn't. Um, the, the actual programs when I watched them and. After years, I can sit there and laugh. Go, that was funny. Yes, I'm proud of that, but that's not an ego thing. And funny enough, I can remove myself, like my wife or someone can walk in, and it sounds pretty weird, but you're laughing at your own stuff. And, you know, you're a wanker, you know. But I'm not laughing at my own stuff because I'm used to when I'm editing, removing myself from it anyway. So I would edit in the second person or third person or something anyway. So I wouldn't be going, oh, I look fat or stupid. I'm just going, oh, what's funny? You know, so I'd already done that. So I can almost watch it removed. Um, of course, I'm still involved in it. But, yes, I'm definitely proud of that. Um, I do want to make more, a shitload more. I, I, I feel there's a... Um, Oh my God! What do you call it? A um, a new chapter the beginning, but somehow, um, with all this other crap that's been happening on these other um, brand stuff, which is funny enough helpful because they can help sponsor stuff and that. But all joking aside, it has been all encompassing and quite mind-boggling, and other shit going on. Um, look, I was saying to Brent today, we've talked about it today in the office. I said, mate, I can't fucking wait. We get this stupid other thing fucking sorted out, blah, 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 talk this out, blah, 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 and we can just get back to making fucking TV, you know, and do some really full-on stuff. And I could tell when he saw me that he he believed what I, he knew what I was talking about, you know, because let's just sort all this shit out and some quasi-passive income crap and let's get back to making some TV. Otherwise, we're just chasing our asses the whole time and making – Quasi videos that hey, why rack a janky now? Well, that's funny, you know. Or why snack a janky chips now? That's funny, you know. But it's it's not. I mean, someone had a cutting comment the other day on I don't know Instagram or something. Uh, uh, it might have been a post about snack a janky or RTD or I don't know one of the brands, and said, fuck yeah, I'm really into it, mate. But um, not as funny as your old, not as funny as your TV stuff. Why don't you get back into that for a change? And 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 you feel like going, oh, go fuck yourself. <laughs> you know, but, you know, but instead you go, yeah, yeah well, why don't you? You know, exactly. You know, I don't know. He was, you know, was, he, was, he wasn't out of line. He was just saying that. And that's cool. Now, of course, I, um, no, no, I certainly, um, as I said, we would be in production now with the TV show had this COVID crap had not been so long, if you know what I mean. Because mm-hmm. actually, I've been there, the TV show. They've already paid the license fee for it. Um, which is actually great because the person who was there when they paid the license fees actually left. So I've got this option now of forgetting about it. <laughs> Just making what you want to make. <laughs> and the new people won't know. <laughs> Let's have this. Or, yeah. or I, I've got the option too. If I do suddenly want to make a TV show, I can read that up and go, um, well, you guys have already paid the license fee for this. Um, you better give me a TV show. Otherwise, you guys are pretty unprofessional. You know, yeah. and okay, what is it? You know, so I've, I've, I can choose now, but I still need to come up with a show. And because of all this COVID stuff, the, my idea for a show, not that I had a, a strong one, but it was, we talked about late night at breakfast, which is very static, it was on a couch. And it was the last one, it was kind of around COVID last time around. 
it's pretty um, stationary show, okay, which is cool. But, you know, I'd argue it's great and some of the best comedy is like that. But after that, I felt like getting off my ass and traveling around the country and being very dynamic and interviewing people and letting them bring the comedy to me a bit more, like, you know, the Bigfoot people, you know, the main characters, you know, you know, there's nothing new with that. So it's a pretty old format, a travel show. But that's what I felt like doing as opposed to um, a sit-down show interview style, which was quite taxing on me as far as coming up with ideas all the time. But who knows? Um, I, I think it's uh, I think it's really cool that you're proud of the stuff that people don't see, and I'm hoping that anyone that's made it this far will be able to see some of it, some of the, that background stuff. I think perhaps one of oh, the biggest yeah. mis misconceptions is because of the way you portray yourself as this sort of bumbling, unprofessional guy that maybe that's how you are, when really it's the total opposite. Like Brent said, like we talked about in the days at school, like the hard work and the hustle that goes into actually oh, getting yeah. these things produced, it's it's really impressive. Oh, totally. And the stress of it, like, you know, because it's, it's been like the newspaper when I said I had to write all the articles, write it, and then sell it. Same with the TV. So you've got to come up with the ideas, you film it with someone, and then also sell it to a sponsor or someone else. So it's kind of nothing's really changed in that front. And I'm not saying I would change that because, especially with comedy, I think the more control you've got over it, um, the less water it down gets. I'm involved in other sort of comedy shows that I, you know where they haven't produced kind of thing where you go, okay, someone comes up for gag, you know, oh, that's quite funny. Okay, and that's it. That's cool. He walks away. He's just the writer. Gives it to a director and a couple of actors. He interprets it slightly different, and they the actors interpret it slightly different. Then the editor gets it, he it slightly, and it ends up really not really quite funny, but it could have been quite funny. And the writer goes, "Well, fuck, it's not my fault. I didn't direct it." The director goes, well, "It's not my fault. I didn't write it." And the actors go, "Fuck, I didn't write it." And the editor goes, oh, it's "Just I'm just going to mature like it." Whereas if you take complete ownership of everything you do, all the way through, rightly or wrongly, you have to go, "Fuck, that didn't work." It's fucking my fault, you know. No one, you know, fuck, we shouldn't have read it, you know. And um, it's not funny enough. Quite often we've had some stuff that's cost us quite a bit or, you know, not just in money but maybe in time. We spend a lot of time on this and it's just not that funny. And some guy goes, well, well imagine, and you, you film another scene. You Put it this way, you're a viewer. Everyone's a viewer before they are a, before they are a producer or a podcast producer. It doesn't matter who you are. Everyone is a consumer. You listen or you or you see it. And they're pretty weird, they're pretty onto it nowadays. So if you watched a comedy show, half hour comedy show, and there was a scene that was two minutes long that was shit, right? You don't care how long it took to film, you don't sort of go, Oh, that's all right, but they spent a lot of money on that, so I'm gonna laugh more. You don't give a fuck. Yeah. But if you said if the producers of that thing, you know what, I don't care what we film on this, this is shit, drop it. And this kid over here has a funnier idea. Let's just film it in one shot and it gets more laughs. What are you better doing? Putting that in or running with the, the crap that you thought you should do because your ego or whatever? So no, you just gotta you just gotta be able to separate yourself from all that crap and go if we're talking about comedy at the moment, is it funny? All right. If it's not, it's not comedy, is it? Yeah. You know, so it's, it's pretty simple. It's a pretty black and white litmus test. You know, it doesn't matter what you spend on it. But those big budget comedy shows, um, it's a bit like Peter Jackson. There's so many scenes in those Hobbit movies because they've already spent so much on the bloody digital effects. They can't cut it out now. You've got to be in there. Same with, with comedy. You don't have to leave it in just because you spent money on it. You know? Shay hates me talking on his behalf, but on behalf of Shay... We need you getting making more comedy. We need some more oh. stuff. Hey, we're so excited. Uh, get some more stuff out there. We're oh, huge. It's um, gonna happen. That's it goes been, in it's been an epic uh, uh, two hours ten. Shay, any last bits before we wrap up? No, I was just gonna say I think one of the one of the things I like about our friend group is that it's twenty plus years of recycled gags and material that just gets built on over time. And one of the great things I enjoy about watching your stuff is that I can look at something from 20 years ago that you put out, still laugh at it now, but still see 
the techniques and the gags honed over time. So as Steve said, I hope that continues and I really look forward to whatever the next project is and I will keep consuming that as long as you're putting it out there. Oh, thanks, guys. So much appreciated. And as I say, look, I'm the same as you. I, I look back at stuff and go, why don't we do more of that? Or that was fun. That, that You get inspired not just by other people's stuff but sometimes even your own stuff that you've disconnected yourself from. So... Look, it's, it's great to – and you know what the most – you know, back to you guys, these conversations are probably the most um, cathartic but also the most um, – what's the word for it? The best you can do for your own brain as far as research to – you know, I'm not going to lie there talking about snail racing and stuff. And it comes up and you start going, Shit, hold on, and you start getting a – a perspective on stuff and you start doing if no one bothered to ask you don't think about it again and you don't think you know hold on is there something we can do is there something more raw can we go back can we go forward you need this sort of stuff so you guys are a huge part of of this process so keep doing what you're doing and i think you're really helping um all the people you talk to and and, and especially people like myself because you know everyone needs to self-evaluate if you know what i'm saying um, you know, good or bad, you need to do that. And um, this is the most healthy way of doing it, I feel. I'm inspired now. Well, if you need two, two, two more assistant producers to join your crew on the next <laughs> mission around the world, we're available. Super fans. I'm, I don't mind being in front of camera. I thought you were talking about two other guys. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's do that, Mysterious Planet, Mysterious Planet 3. We'll skip to Ghost Rex 3. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's been epic, Lee. Thanks so much, man. That's been so, so good. So good. Oh, likewise, guys. Um, yeah, so good. Hopefully catch up in real life for a beer sometime. Yeah, well, hey, um, keep keep in touch um, off off air there, and I'll we'll we'll, um, we'll we'll catch up there and fire some stuff through to you. Sounds good. <laughs>